Stan Efferding, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. What do you think are the main causes of the obesity epidemic? Why is it that the average American's got so much fatter over the last few decades? I don't want to talk about what Stan thinks. I want to talk about what we see as probably what the academic community's consensus is. Um, I'm kind of a collator of information as a personal trainer for 30 years, and I want to deliver that information to my clients and make sure it's evidence-based. And so I'll, I'll refrain from opinions. I've tried that in the past, and I've been <clears throat> probably correctly um, and soundly <laughs> uh, informed of my, my inaccuracy. So uh, at, at the core of it all, we're consuming more calories than we used to 50 years ago. We know that from all the research. Um, and the majority of those calories or the, the cause of that seems to be, um, hyper palatable, ultra processed foods. And it seems to have interfered with our ability to, uh, uh, become satiated. And, um, so we're eating too much and we're in this food environment where that's really easy to do. It's hard to shut it off. And so it really is calories. And I know that sparks a whole bunch of, uh, uh, bad feelings from folks. You know, it, it kind of gets you those straw man arguments about, Kiko, calories in, calories out, is, you know, doesn't work and, and all of that. But it's a little, it's more complex than that. Um, I've said, move more, eat less is truthful, but not useful. Necessary, but not sufficient, perhaps? Yeah. Well, it's just, it is what's happening and it is the solution. Uh, but it, you know, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. And so there's a whole host of factors I think we can dive into on that, but Fact of the matter, it is, it is calories. The Kiko is an oversimplification. It's actually an energy balance equation that accounts for all of these variables, which we may talk about, the total daily energy intake minus the total daily energy expenditure. And there's a whole host of things that go into both sides of that equation uh, that it really accounts for uh, just about everything that, that, uh, that goes into weight gain. Why is calories in, calories out, and diet, fads and discussions in general so emotionally charged i would think that this would just be it's i'm not calling you a good or a bad person there's no reason for you to believe that you are anything this isn't a comment on you and yet diet discussions online are some of the most virulent uh, uh, and aggressive that you see they really are i think part of it might just be that we want to find uh, i said pin the tail on the donkey find one single source that maybe is uh something that we could fix if we just got rid of it. Uh, the carbohydrate insulin model spawned from that, where if you eat a grape and your insulin goes up, that you're going to gain fat and you can't lose, uh, you're got, you can't lose fat. Uh, <clears throat> certain demonizing certain foods became very popular. There's still a lot of that going on, whether it's fructose or seed oils or uh, anything that might correlate with overconsumption. Um, I think also that when you talk about calories in, calories out, it seems to blame the victim, the individual who's having a hard time losing weight. Um, they become, uh, you blame them. You're overeating, you're lazy, you're undisciplined, uh, you know, that kind of thing, uh, without paying attention to all the other factors that go into that. And it's just an oversimplification. I suppose that Calories in, calories out, when you fold in how hyperpalatable these new foods are, it's not putting all of the blame at the feet of the victim. It's like, look, this is a, a relatively unfair battle because of how well engineered these yeah. foods are for you to overeat. Now, ultimately, it's you that put it in your mouth, but yeah. it is a more difficult uphill climb. Agreed. And another problem is, is that while well, we have a genetic predisposition, obviously, now we're starting to see that uh, uh, certain people have different hunger signaling. Ghrelin release. Ghrelin release, leptin sensitivity or lack thereof. Um, and certain people, while we don't believe their basal metabolic rate is significantly different, we do see that some people are more active, what we call non-exercise activity thermogenesis than others. My son and daughters like that. My son, you have to almost check and see if he's breathing when he's sitting there watching TV sometimes. He's just, he's like a zombie. <laughs> and my daughter can't sit down. And she's humming all the time and tapping her toes and <laughs> bouncing around and skipping. And she has to get up. And uh, two di very different um, 
you know, movement patterns. And people with high non-exercise activity thermogenesis can burn over a thousand calories a day more than somebody with low non-exercise activity thermogenesis. We see that in active individuals versus, uh, say, sedentary jobs versus, uh, say, a construction worker or a waitress as opposed to a desk worker. So we see a lot of uh, calories can be accounted for in that component of the equation, the energy balance equation. So those things all play play into it. And then there's also a big social com component to talk about some folks in lower socioeconomic environments are exposed to more of this uh, hyperpalatable ultra-processed food uh, from an earlier age. It's, uh, it's very affordable. It's uh, very convenient and accessible. Uh, and that uh, that has a huge impact. What role does the formative years of growing up have on our palate and what we enjoy. There's a a period of life, I think it's between about 10 and 15, and the music that you listen to during that time is very formative for the kind of music that you will enjoy throughout the rest of your life. Are you aware if there's an equivalent when it comes to tastes and diets and stuff? I'm not sure, but I, I think that, you know, obviously children are going to migrate towards the kind of foods that taste the best, uh, presuming they're uh, allowed in the home in, in whatever, to whatever degree. Uh, but we all, but we do see that children um, with obese parents who uh, tend to uh, gain more weight at an earlier age and have a higher likelihood of becoming obese uh, as they get older. So it is definitely a problem that has to be addressed at a very early age. You mentioned seed oils, which is one of the four horsemen of the diet apocalypse. I'm not sure what the other three are. Yeah. Just how bad are seed oils? What's the truth about them? Well, you know, before we jumped on here, I talked about people evolve, science evolves. Uh, you know, when you overlay um, a graph of seed oil consumptions against obesity, you see a, a very strong correlation. I mean, they would just look identical. Uh, and so one would, you know, correlation does not equal causation. One would think that that, that was uh, one of the potential causes. Everything else seems to have gone down over time. Fructose and sugar consumption seems to have stabilized or gone down over time. Uh, but seed oils, like a lot of things, um, how can I best explain this? There's, uh, they're not all the same thing. So here's what the academic community is saying now, that we don't have any evidence that, that seed oils cause inflammation um, in their natural form, if, if that can even be said about seed oils, there's nothing natural necessarily about them. But in so much as they, can, that they are a part of processed foods, ultra processed foods, about 70% of seed oils are consumed as a part of ultra processed foods and fast foods. Now, seed oils reheated, think French fries, you know, any of those uh, chicken McNuggets, whatever, in those big vats of oil that you reheat, those do show uh, an inflammatory response and increase of cardiovascular disease risk. So that that is a problem. I did a video many years ago. Uh, it said the real poison that's killing us. So I'm 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 certainly guilty of having uh, put all seed oils into one bucket. Uh, but in that video, I did say um, I'm biased. They are a poison to me. Seed oils, I discovered many years later, uh, give me diarrhea. And I go into great detail, if anybody wants to know, if it's not TMI, in my video. <laughs> uh, it's one of those where you're running to the bathroom and you can't quite make it and you have to stop and do that Kegel exercise or something bad's going to happen before you get there. It's one of those deals. And it's very unique to seed oils. And I know when I've consumed too much of them, the flat iron steak cooked in a big pool of seed oil at a restaurant. Otherwise, you, you know, I wouldn't have a problem if it was grilled on a, on a flame uh, or when I cook it at home in a, uh, in, a, in a ninja grill or something. Very different response. Even going to restaurants and getting, you know, I own a meal prep company. Uh, and so we have, to, uh, we have to get eggs for the meal prep company. And some of those eggs come in five gallon buckets, like at, you know, some of the restaurants that you would eat at a Denny's or, or the like, and they just ladle the eggs and put them on the grill. And so I would ask, please, no oils, because I'm allergic to these oils. Well, come to find out a lot of those buckets of eggs, we had a hard time finding them uh, that didn't, weren't already adulterated with seed oils, uh, whether it was canola oil or uh, soybean oil, uh, partly for preservation. Because it is a preservative, but 
probably partly because that's uh, an inexpensive additive, which would you know increase, um, I guess, the profit margin on the five-gallon bucket. When I would consume those, because there's already seed oil in the mixture, then I would have the same problem. And so it's been very difficult for me over the years. Uh, I used to love to go to some of these uh, uh, what are those all-you-can-eat grills that they have with, the, and they you know, just get steak and chicken and and uh, you know rice and have them grill them. But they would put a big ladle of these oils on there to cook it in, and I would have gastric distress. So, as a personal matter, I've I've objected quite strongly. I went down the uh, Weston A. Price rabbit hole and Nina Ty Colt's rabbit hole for seed oils, and uh, I was you know I was fully on that team. Uh, but the the the, the the literature does not support if you're not allergic to them like I am and you're not reheating them or over consuming them. It doesn't support um, any other adverse effect than that. Have you got any idea how common a adverse reaction or a uh, intolerance of seed oils is? I don't. And I used to think it was relatively common because a lot of people would suffer from IBS and, uh, and IBD and uh, but I can't, I can't make that assessment. I just know that's how I respond. And I have, of course, in my business come across a lot of people who maybe felt that was the same, but I just don't think there's research to support it. You had a problem with one of the great American institutions that I'm a massive fan of, Cheesecake Factory. Yeah. They, they diddled you. They diddled you with a burger, maybe. Yeah. Now I can get one of my favorite meals that I've been promoting for years is the Monster Mash. I, I, I trademarked that uh, Monster Mash. And it's just a blend of, say, uh, ground beef or bison with uh, white rice and some bone broth. And I'll mash all that together. I might cook some peppers and throw it in there, a little bit of spinach and, and maybe even a scrambled egg. And I ha this is my my mash. Is I, I make this and sell it, ship it all over the states to people, and I give it to all my clients that uh, uh, you know Hofthor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw and the rest of them. Lane Johnson's favorite meal, the Monster Mash. Um, and so I can get that meal at Cheesecake Factory, but they will either baste or uh, uh, put the burger in uh, sear it first in vegetable oil before they put it on the flame grill to prevent it from burning, to, to keep it. You know, the same thing would be true, say, of those roasted chickens, the rotisserie chickens at Costco. They baste those with a vegetable oil because it helps prevent them from, from burning. They can cook there a little longer. And, uh, and so those are the little things I have to watch out for. So yes, Cheese Factory is my, my one device, but uh, because I'm so OCD and I'm a creature of habit, that ever since I've been going there, I go order my little monster mash from them. I get a side hamburger patty, a side of white rice, uh, a side of uh, bone broth, maybe throw in some pickles, and of course the sourdough bread is always good. And that's my that's my favorite meal at Cheesecake. And I I don't much participate in in desserts. I've never been that way. Uh, needless to say, my wife and kids order something very different. Uh, but that's uh, that's my favorite spot to stop at because they're generally in every big city in the country, and I travel a lot. I'm a cheesecake guy. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Cheesecake Factory. Yeah. What is, how do you explain to people, let's say that somebody hasn't been introduced to the vertical diet before, how do you conceptualize it? How do you explain it to people? Yeah. You know, the vertical diet is really uh, everything I want my clients to know and to, to do. Um, it's a compilation of everything I've learned from over 30 years, from college to coaching, uh, to competing, to being coached collaborating with great athletes, um, and then partnering with Dr. Damon McCune, who's a PhD RDN director of dietetics at UNLV. And we got together and spent uh, a couple of years together producing and uh, putting science to uh, over 250 peer-reviewed published articles. And then, of course, references to lots of videos and um, uh, just, I, I think, professionals in the industry and they're each in their respective fields that help my clients um, navigate all the things that are important because it's multifactorial. It's not just a diet, right? It's obviously, you know, it's nutrition, uh, it's digestion, it's uh, sleep, hydration, injury prevention and, and rehab, uh, blood testing, uh, blood sugar, blood pressure management. Uh, it's just a chapter after chapter after chapter of the things that I commonly uh, questions I've been asked and things that I want my clients to to do to be successful in a program because it's not just one thing. You have poor sleep, your diet's not going to fix that problem. Uh, you know, you've got to uh, 
<laughs> crappy diet, uh, then you know everything else suffers. And so, it uh, I try and make sure that I uh, I cover all these bases for them. Um, of course, there's a lot of individual inter individual variability, so I have to. Well, it feels like I'm rewriting every program when I, I deal with a client. I give them a detailed questionnaire and have them respond. I find out what their goals are, what their genetic predispositions are, you know, what they prefer in terms of foods that they like to eat and uh, when they like to eat, where they like to eat, just kind of their lifestyle, um, what constraints they might have, any injuries, uh, uh, digestive distress. Uh, I love the blood work because I might be able to see, you know, challenges that need to be uh, overcome. Uh, and then try and make sure that they can improve each and every one of those areas that I think are important. And I ask them to send me on a daily basis, not weekly, because I think by then, if somebody goes off the rails for three days, you, they might ghost you and you lose them. On a daily basis, I ask them to send me uh, their hours of sleep, their morning body weight, and a picture of each meal. Uh, so that you know, it's more for their information, um, you know, their accountability, uh, that which gets measured gets improved. And then it is for my information necessarily, unless I see something that's significantly awry. And then weekly, we do waste measurements and um, progress pictures, because oftentimes we're the last to see our progress. And if I get a client to take a progress picture on day one, two months later, they're like, I'm not making any progress. You put those side by side, and generally you see a significant change that they don't see. And the scale might not tell the whole story. You might get a client only loses two pounds, but they might lose four inches on their waist and, and look significantly tighter and, and maybe stronger and feel better. Uh, so all of those things factor into it. From the diet side, what are the principles that you're following there? What are the, what are the thermodynamics of yeah. the vertical diet? Let's see if I can go down this one, two, three. Calories are king. If you want to gain weight, you have to be in a surplus. And remember, I did both bodybuilding and powerlifting throughout my career. So I bulked up to over 300 pounds and I dieted down to single digit body fat to compete as a bodybuilder and then, you know, bulked back up to compete as a powerlifter. So conservatively speaking, over a 25 year of competing, going back as far as 1988, I've gained and lost well over a thousand pounds. And I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. That's I, insane. I, I did I did a lot wrong. I always say if I knew then what I know now, I would have saved myself a whole lot of trouble and probably been able to perform at a much higher level at a much younger age because I didn't reach my peak until I turned 40. Uh, so uh, calories are king. Surplus to gain weight, deficit to lose weight. Next would be your macros, protein being the most important of those, getting sufficient protein to fuel uh, or to build muscle, or at least to retain lean mass when dieting. And protein can be manipulated to either eat less of it in order to be less satiated so you can eat more total calories. That's actually a, a strategy that we use for people who have a hard time eating enough food uh, because it's very satiating and has a high thermic effect of food, meaning for every 100 calories you consume, you net out about 70 uh, just the the calorie cost of digesting protein is more so than carbs and fats. Um, or if you're trying to lose weight, we might bump that up. Instead of a gram per pound of goal weight, we might even go up to 1.2 grams. For the very same reason, you know, flipping the script, it's more satiating and has a higher thermic effect of food. So you can you feel like you're eating more volume of food, but you're netting out uh, less total calories. And so, uh, so that's macros, protein being the most important of which you have to have sufficient fats for health to get, get to sleep for your hormones. Uh, you start getting too low on fats and you're going to have some problems with both of those things. But, and now we start getting into my personal preference because fats beyond that, which provide you a health benefit, don't provide you a performance benefit. And so the rest for me is carbs, about 30, 35% protein, about 30% fat, and that's actually about a two to one protein to fat ratio. If you're going to consume 200 grams of protein, you get in about 100 grams of fat. They're equivalent in terms of calories because you've got nine calories per gram for fat and four calories per gram for protein. But it's around 30, 35% protein, around 30% fat. And that would leave about 40% carbs, which I think are important for performance. I don't just me think that, but that's what, that's what science tells us, especially anaerobic performance, which would be, you know, strength training, sports, explosive sports, that those carbohydrates are very important for those bouts of training and performance. And so I leave room in there. I also find that that more closely uh, is what's commonly consumed, although the protein's a little higher. I think people would consume more commonly around 18 
12%. We see that, say, in the Mediterranean diet. That's about an 18% protein diet. No one accidentally eats more than about 0.7 or 0.8 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. No one accidentally, unless you go to the buffet that you mentioned earlier right. on. Yeah. Like, it has to be purposeful. Yeah, and it should be. I believe it should be. Uh, you heard Dr. Gabrielle Lyons talking about being the organ of longevity. It's a sink for glucose. I think those are great descriptors of what protein is. Uh, we also see that when you compare a 30% protein intake to an 18% in protein intake, say with the uh, Mediterranean diet, you see improved uh, insulin sensitivity, improved glucose numbers. It, uh, again, for a couple of reasons, uh, protein seems to decrease postprandial glycemia, particularly when you eat it first in a What's meal. That? After a meal, postprandial glycemia, that would be the peak elevation and duration of, uh, of blood sugars, uh, kind of measured as an area under the curve. And so when you eat protein first and you eat a large amount of protein, you have fewer fluctuations, less area under the curve of blood sugar post-meal. Uh, and so that, that tends to help for that reason as well. And likely because you're eating less of other foods if you're eating more protein. Uh, and you know, just less what we call glycemic load, probably fewer total carbs. So that's kind of where I put my percentages. I find that, that that's, uh, and then those carbs, uh, the proteins consist of uh, a wide variety of proteins. I like, to, I like to see red meat in the diet. Uh, and we can dive into that. I like to see salmon in the diet at least two or three times a week, obviously for EPA and DHA, omega-3s. Uh, I like to see dairy in the diet. Uh, preferentially yogurt. Fat-free Greek yogurt is one of my favorites. It's uh, it's a superfood. Have you got a brand of Greek yogurt that you prefer, that you really I like? I like Costco's Kirkland Greek yogurt as, as fat-free because it's not chalky. It's still creamy, just as a personal preference for taste. Um, I like to see uh, eggs. It could be an egg-egg white blend uh, because I want to keep the yolk in there for its uh, all the vitamins and minerals in there, the choline and the biotin and the like. Um uh, I mentioned red meat and I should have said iron, B12, zinc, all of those things. But I'll use a leaner cut because ultimately, and I probably should have started with this, it's the overall dietary pattern that matters a lot more than individual foods. I don't think you should eat too much of anything. Uh, could potentially leave you exposed to having too little of something else possibly. Uh, and in the case of, of say red meat, of course, there is maybe some concern that fatty meats or too high saturated fats intake may elevate LDL in some individuals um, and therefore increase cardiovascular disease risk. And that's multifactorial. I don't you know, presume to think that that's the only thing that matters, but uh, that is uh, something that we do, uh, we do pay attention to, particularly in blood work, because we certainly want to keep people's LDL within the range that uh, you know, we generally Saturated fats are under 10% of total calories. It's kind of easy to do. If 30% of your total calories are fats and something like a top sirloin steak or uh, even an egg, egg white blend, only about a third of that is saturated fat. So you got 30% times 30%. There's your 9% below the American Heart Association's recommendation for 10%. So you can have steak and eggs every morning for breakfast along with you know monitoring the type of, uh, of fats that you take in along with, you know, say a fat-free Greek yogurt, which is cardioprotective. Uh, so you get some benefits from that, along with some fruits, which again, cardioprotective, uh, reduces inflammation. Those uh, citrus flavonoids are, are incredible. Uh, so the dietary pattern matters most. So a variety of protein sources. The fats are generally in the protein, although it might be nice to get a little olive oil in there with your salad with dinner. That uh, uh, tends to be a lot of nice things going on with uh, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, and then the carbohydrates, I start with uh, high potassium carbohydrates, which would be, say, a daily potato uh, has 1,000 milligrams of potassium, over twice that of a banana. Fruits are great for that, especially low sugar fruits, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, those kinds of things. Oranges. Uh, another reason I like oranges and potatoes is, uh, which this conversation should evolve into very shortly, satiety. Uh, there is a satiety index that measures the length of time certain foods keep you full. It's a subjective measurement when they just interview people based on foods that they eat. And way at the top of that list, of course, you're going to have proteins and fibers, but you're also going to have foods like uh, boiled potatoes and oranges. And so I like the dual benefit of the high potassium, relatively low sugar in those fruits, 
um, but also the satiety benefit. Because anybody who's in a calorie deficit, that's what I'm shooting for. I might do just the opposite of somebody's gain weight. I might pull the potato out and throw in white rice. I might pull the orange out and put in orange juice. Uh, just to flip the script on that. And I don't mean to keep bouncing back and forth, but the, the diet isn't all things for all people. And so that, uh, once you get, you know, of course you throw your salad in there, you can get some more, certainly some more potassium from spinach or whatever, you know, fiber, uh, some nuts. If you get a little bit of magnesium out of that, some mixed nuts. And that is pretty much the foundation of the vertical diet. If you want to talk specifically about the kinds of foods I recommend and the macros, that's kind of all contained in that explanation. This episode is brought to you by levels. One of the single biggest predictors of how long you live and how good you'll feel while living is your metabolic health. The single best way to work out how your daily decisions are impacting your longevity and your vitality is by tracking your glucose. This is why I wear a continuous glucose monitor from levels. It allows me to understand in real time how the foods that I'm eating are impacting my health and the way that I feel. The Levels app interprets your glucose data and gives you a score after each meal so that you can see how different meals are impacting you and it will give you personalized diet recommendations that are right for your body. Glucose is a huge determinant of not only your vitality and your longevity, but of the way that you feel day to day. Using Levels means that you take the guesswork out of this. It can help you to nudge your diet towards something which is going to be better for you right now and in the long term as well. After using Levels, I realized that if I have a large carb meal and I do not go for a walk afterward, my blood glucose goes through the roof and I don't feel so good. Head to levels.link slash modern wisdom to take advantage of an exclusive offer plus get that 90 day money back guarantee. That's levels.link slash modern wisdom. Two different foods that you've touched on there, which are often demonized. Red meat. No. Is it killing everybody? Well, again, what's the dietary pattern? Are you eating a ton of really fatty meats, bacon, Butter is usually thrown into that group, even though it's not a meat, but it's commonly uh, it's a side a of a meat. Right. Uh, tons of ribeyes. And are you susceptible? You know, what's your body composition? What's your exercise look like? Uh, are you consuming sufficient fiber? Well, let's say, let's say that someone is not a total renegade with this, and they realize that they shouldn't be eating super fatty cuts of meat, that they shouldn't be cooking it in tons and tons of butter, that they shouldn't be having bags and bags and bags of bacon. There is a movement at the moment guys like Brian Johnson, who are mTOR, activating the mTOR pathway is a nightmare. I avoid meat, red meat specifically. There is concerns from the FDA. There is concerns from all manner of people who are experts in, in some circles with regards to diet that say red meat is something that you should have once a month at the absolute most. Yeah. Why? What is it that you're seeing that they're not? Uh, well, you mentioned, um, it was the first one you mentioned. Oh, mTOR stimulation. Well, that, uh, there's a difference between acute and chronic inflammation or mTOR stimulation and the acute inflammation or, or stimulation of mTOR doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, and that would be the same protein in general. It wouldn't be specific to red meat. Any protein would stimulate mTOR. Uh, and the problem that you get is, is, is that as we age, we become, uh, anabolically resistant at some point or less and less anabolically uh, <clears throat> sensitive. And uh, a lot of people as they age suffer from, uh, they don't eat enough protein and they suffer from sarcopenia. And that can be a bigger problem for mortality risk than consuming red meat or any meat there, you know, for that matter. And I think uh, if I'm citing the right person, I think Kevin Hall has done a lot of research on that uh, and is the and opposes that theory, uh, that theory, that longevity theory. I think that comes a little bit from Sinclair, a little bit from um, Walter Longo, those folks. Uh, you know, it's a lot of mouse studies. You have no human evidence, no no human outcome trials showing that that uh, is going to uh, limit lifespan. The problem with a lot of that research is it's usually uh, influenced by the healthy user bias. People who tend to eat more red meat, tend to smoke more, drink more, weigh more, exercise less. Uh, and they eat all the things that are associated with it. You know, the bacon double cheeseburgers with the bun and the uh, soda pop and, and the fries. Um, and, you know, and the dessert with that and maybe a couple of beers. That's obviously, you know, they try and control for that in some of the epidemiology. It's imperfect. And they try and stratify the risk based on other health markers. Uh, but for the most part, again, as part of a healthy diet, 
keeping your, you know, watching your LDLs. Uh, I guess the only other concern would be cancer. And that you, you mentioned that uh, World Health Organization, you may have mentioned, uh, and IARC. Uh, I find it interesting now. We've got this uh, this big blowback on aspartame. IARC came out and said that aspartame was uh, associated with cancer risk. What's your read on that? Well, my read is that they study, they look at mouse studies and uh, with uh, huge doses, and uh, it's not their job to look at doses. And so, I think what was the do you, do you know what the relative, how much you're a human, is it, would I have had to have consumed three and a half cases of it Dr. Was, Pepper? It was something like 800 Cokes or something. A day? day? Yeah, to get that level of aspartame. Uh, but the point of that story is, is that, and none of the, the nutrition PhDs, which is the people that I usually uh, turn my ear towards when things like this come out, none of them consider this to be a concern. Uh, we do have uh, plenty of human trials, randomized control trials showing evidence that when you replace sugar sweetened beverages with diet sodas, you see weight loss and therefore improved health outcomes. Right. Just, let's just dig in this for one second. Uh, this is something that came up with a bunch of different stories I've heard from you. A lot of the time, uh, people will demonize the thing which is seemingly less natural. It's got a name like aspartame instead of sugar. Yeah. But what they don't realize is that the weight loss from switching from sugar to aspartame is so significant that tons and tons of downstream benefits for health come from that. Yeah. And it seems like the concern mm -hmm. from aspartame has to be at dosages so insane that you would essentially be hooked up to an IV, yeah. like like Warren Buffett's nightmare, yeah. Yeah. just pumping it into your veins. It's nothing for anybody to worry about. You hit on an interesting point there when I, I talk about uh, the importance of, of the overall dietary pattern and then your general physical health. Weight loss, I, I said this uh, on a podcast not too long ago, and it was clipped and thrown onto the internet, just a little clip of it. And I said that 95% of health benefits are realized strictly from weight loss itself, irrespective of diet. And I referenced the McDonald's diet. We have multiple studies now, the McDonald's diet, the Twinkie diet, the 7-Eleven diet, where when, when people eat even a lot of quote unquote crappy food, junk food, fast food, when they're able to maintain a calorie deficit and lose weight, they see decreases in all of their biomarkers. They see lowered cholesterol, lowered blood sugar, lowered blood, blood pressure, and weight loss itself we know is associated with decreased cancer risk. So that should be the primary goal, weight loss. Obviously, those kinds of diets long-term, particularly if they're high in saturated fats and maybe your LDL starts to go up eventually, uh, potentially if you're not exercising or if you lose a significant amount of lean muscle mass because you're not lifting weights. So, so there's a whole host of problems. At the end of that, I said I would never recommend a McDonald's diet. That gets clipped out. <laughs> <laughs> for, internet, uh, internet, for please leave reasons. that bit in. Yeah, which time. we've touched on already is satiety being the key of the uh, reason for that is, is that the best diet is the one you'll follow. Uh, and hunger is the biggest reason why people uh, will fail on a diet. Which and, is why I keep and, going and back to satiety. When you're looking at the highly processed, very calorie dense foods, that if you were to do the McDonald's diet, and it is possible to lose weight on it, I think it was 1800 calories, 1850, 18, something yeah, like that. Yeah. You'd be very hungry. Uh, but precisely. Yeah. Because think about how dense those calories are. Think about how little food yeah. you get for those 1800 calories. I mean, yeah. what? It's probably a a medium meal, maybe a large meal with a Coke, a full fat Coke would be. It, it wouldn't be a lot of food. Yep. It'd be, like you say, maybe a cheeseburger, probably. I think he had to eat half of this, half of that to get through the day. Mm, uh, yeah. But nonetheless, the, the point is uh, that the weight loss is the primary goal. And we see this with a lot of diets, a lot of diet tribes. We see this with keto. And, and my goal here isn't to shit on anybody's diet plan. Uh, there's many paths to the same destination. And I believe they're all uh, uh, very individualistic. And, and the, the best path is the one that seems the least restrictive. So you can adhere to it long term. And, and some people like to lower their carbs. Some people like to eliminate. I guess we should just say there's, there's three paths. There's not many paths. There's three paths to, the, to, to dieting. All of them result in a calorie deficit. One is uh, calorie restriction. That's where you're counting calories and you're checking the labels on the, and you're weighing and measuring food and you're using your little, uh, you know, your, your computer or your phone to track your calories. That's, that's one method of, of controlling calories. Uh, 
<laughs> the other one is time restriction. Uh, and that's, you're just going to eat like with a 16-8, or maybe that doesn't work for you. You got to go to an 18-6 or a 24 until you just can't eat enough calories in your window to, uh, to, to gain weight and you start losing weight. Uh, the other ones would be dietary restriction, and that's where you start eliminating foods. That would be a keto, get rid of carbs. That would be a vegan, get rid of meats. Uh, that would be a paleo, get rid of everything that was, you know, created after 1960 or something like that. Gravitarian, <laughs> everything that didn't fall to the ground at its own accord. Yeah. So those are your options, and you pick one, uh, if you may, or uh, you know, find something that works, or a combination of the two. The intermittent fasting keto diet got, became real popular as a one-two punch for a while. Uh, but how sustainable are they for you? And, and different people have different long-term results, but the research shows none of them are any better than the other long-term. Is there anything special about intermittent fasting? Is there some super secret source that gets activated after a particular amount of time? Does the increased ghrelin release, is the hunger signal, hormesis response, what does the science say here? In so much as it allows you to maintain a calorie deficit and you lose weight, it can be a healthy diet plan. That's going to be very individualistic. Some people can skip breakfast or skip dinner and not feel uh, as though that's too restrictive and can adhere to that diet for some period of time. But we, there's been a lot of things claimed about intermittent fasting, some special autophagy benefit or some special uh, reduction in mTOR signaling or some satiety benefit, which isn't consistent across the population. You see... Uh, it's very individualistic. We don't see any uh, extra benefits above the calorie restriction itself. And we see in the research that continuous calorie restriction and intermittent fasting perform very much the same in terms of weight loss and health benefits long term. Where is the magic fairy dust claims about intermittent fasting coming from then? If you can't find it and there are people out there who say that it's happening, what are they reading that you're not, or what are they seeing that's incorrect? Uh, that's the problem with the research. You can, there's peer review published research to support just about any position on any nutrient or diet. Um, there's a evidence hierarchy that you're familiar with. Way down at the bottom is those mouse studies and Petri dishes and anecdotes. And then you step up one step maybe, and you've got um, expert advice, which even that one's challenging because expert at what? You get somebody who's a, a chiropractor talking about nutrition. That's not necessarily within their domain-specific expertise. We see a lot of that. Uh, the, uh, the nutrition PhDs take particular offense to that. Uh, just because somebody has an MD or a PhD after their name doesn't mean it's, uh, it's in nutrition. Uh, next up from that, you're going to look at probably epidemiology, research on uh, large populations of people, uh, and then randomized controlled trials above that, particularly ones that are performed on humans where you can uh, adjust certain variables. And then you get up to systematic reviews or meta-analyses where they take, you know, they cluster together uh, the body of evidence that qualifies for the criterion, and they uh, they try and come up with something that is a little more representative of what all of the research suggests, not a cherry-picked uh, study. Um, and then beyond that, even, we've got uh, professionals that will review all of that and make, um, you know, have a position paper, like the International meta, Society meta. of Sports Nutrition. or Yeah, uh, because those people are probably more qualified to review those systematic reviews. Uh, and there's, you know, obviously there's the Cochrane Collaboration. I think they're in 51 countries with thousands of, of uh, scientists that uh, and kind of recognizes the gold standard for um, being the least influenced potentially by um, maybe uh, uh, biases, et cetera. So there's different quality of information. I mean, to go too far off the rails, but uh, some people will find um, you know, cherry pick is the word we use, a particular study that uh, acted to their benefit. Sometimes, I'll just use keto as an example. When you control for calories and protein, you see equivalent uh, outcomes uh, amongst people who do high carb or low carb. You know, uh, We saw that in the Diet Fits trial out of Stanford. There was over 600 people that were uh, over a year long, and they did low carb and high carb and didn't find any significant difference in satiety, weight loss, um, 
uh, glycemia. They didn't see any difference in any of those things. And interestingly enough, Gary Taub's uh, research arm was part of that um, that study. So over and over again, when you look at the body of evidence, randomized control trials in humans in particular, and, and the, the systematic reviews of those, you just, you don't see any difference. You see that the trends are that it's very in individualistic. Uh, and even within a particular study, when you show some sort of uh, uh, measurable result, you've got a lot of inter-individual variables. You've got people who didn't have any result or, or you know, you've got people who lost a lot of weight, you've got people who gained a lot of weight. And what the average is might not appeal or, or apply to you as an individual. So, uh, and I hate saying all of this. Well, I'm on both sides of the fence on this. I like that the individual now knows they have options and there, and there isn't a best diet and they're not required to go keto or uh, if they want to get results. Uh, it's unnecessary. Even if they have type 2 diabetes, the weight loss itself is the driver of insulin sensitivity, not the fact that they eliminated carbs. And we've had studies done where people with type 2 diabetes did a high carb and a low carb diet, had equivalent outcomes. So I want people to have as many options as possible. That gets us to now their eyes have glossed over and are like, well, what do I do? And uh, that's where I come in with some very specific recommendations, uh, which, you know, then I got to get feedback and make those adjustments because. The general audience, the general population, they don't have all this. This isn't their business. They have they have a different business. They have a different field of expertise. They have a family. They have kids. They have a career. They have, you know, they just at the end of the day, just just tell me exactly what to eat. And so I, I give them a very specific diet plan. I tell them exactly what to eat, how many ounces of this, how many you know, based on the feedback that they give me from my questionnaire. Uh, but then we have to you know tune in and listen. You know, how do you feel? Do you feel satiated? Um, there is a, um, weight control, uh, what's it called? Uh, registry that has tracked, uh, successful dieters over 10,000 dieters, uh, going back a couple of decades who have lost over 66 pounds and maintained the weight loss for over five years. And there were some key things, uh, some common things. It's kind of like the millionaire next door. What are, what are things that, that these people do consistently? Success leaves clues. And we saw that 98% of these people went on a diet. They had a plan, okay? And it doesn't matter which diet. These people went on many different diets. I have vegan clients. I have carnivore clients. I have keto clients. I have vertical diet clients. It's their personal preference. 98% uh, went on a diet. They had a plan. So that, does, that is important. Um, 95% of them increased their activity level, walking being the number one activity level. Uh, and we can get into how important and effective that is. 78% uh, of them ate breakfast every morning. And that's not to say you have to eat breakfast, but it's certainly not to say that intermittent fasting, skipping breakfast is required to lose weight when the vast majority of the people in, in the largest, longest, most successful study demonstrates that 78% ate breakfast. And I don't care if you do or don't. My daughter doesn't like breakfast. She's never hungry in the morning. My son eats breakfast. It's very personal. It's very individualistic. We can talk about some where breakfast might be important, uh, but for now, we'll, we'll go on to the next one. With 75% of people um, weigh themselves regularly. Again, that which gets measured gets improved. Now, I have come across clients that said they have an uncomfortable relationship with the scale. <laughs> uh, and that's generally because they let the daily fluctuations influence their mood when you should be adding up the week, weigh in every day, add up to seven days, divide it by seven to get a, a weekly average, and then compare that weekly average to the other weekly averages throughout the month. That's a better way to, to manage the scale. Well, that sounds good in theory, but in practice, uh, my wife's been dieting for years, uh, and when she steps on that scale, it will determine her mood. Uh, and on that note, I said that, that I coined a term some years ago, compliance is the science. That the best diet's the one you'll follow. So I try and create a diet program that people comply with. Something that become, it's, you know, I cover the book here. It's simple, sensible, and sustainable. Okay. Something that becomes part of a lifestyle. And so one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the things that the research shows us is that meal prep, not shilling for my meal prep company, but prepping meals, uh, whether I prep or you prep, uh, we see this in the bodybuilding figure physique bikini industry going back decades, as long as, as that industry has been in existence. 
uh, those people, uh, those people, me, we, uh, that's my, that's my brethren. That's my home bodybuilding. So I came up in this industry. Uh, we pack our meals into Tupperwares and we throw them in our six pack bag and we, you know, that's, we've got everything we need for the day. Uh, meal prepping is one of the number one behaviors that leads to long-term success. And if you prep your meals, whether twice a week or, you know, every morning for the day, and you know exactly, and it's measured and weighed exactly what you're supposed to eat, even Weight Watchers, very successful, uh, as long as you adhere to it and consistently eat the meals that they recommend, any meal prep uh, provides uh, a greater opportunity for success because then you're not randomly opening the refrigerator when you're hungry uh, and grabbing what you're hungry for. Um, call that food reward and end up over consuming it or it's lunchtime. Oh my God, I'm famished. You get in the car, you drive to your favorite, you know, whatever you're hungry for uh, fast food place, possibly at that, at that moment, you tend to over consume those foods. So what I try and do is, is instill behaviors. Uh, the meal prep is a, is a big one. We talked about satiety and we have a toolbox that, that we can use to help us improve our satiety. So we're not hungry all the time. And it's somewhat effective. Um, it's things like uh, increasing protein intake, increasing fiber intake, eating more whole foods and fewer ultra-processed foods, uh, drinking more fluids with meals, which is where diet soda and iced tea can come in very handy, as well as water. Uh, helps fill the stomach up, and it, you know the, the rugae of the stomach expands and sends the signal that you're that you're full, and, and that satiety feeling is very desirable in a meal, whether it's uh, acquired through a massive amount of calories or just a, a hard, large volume of food that, that may not uh, yield as many calories, including fluids. Um, beyond that, uh, mindful eating, you know, not sitting there in front of a TV or an iPhone and, and, and shoveling in food until all of a sudden the, the plate's gone. Um, <clears throat> eating more protein and eating protein first in the meal tends to help with satiety. Uh, and there may be a few in there I forgot, but but that's kind of our toolbox that we like, like to utilize, encourage our clients to, uh, because as soon as they get hungry, you're going to start losing that battle. Willpower is not a good strategy uh, to overcome hunger. You'll lose that battle every time. Why is it the case, given this many thousand person, very successful trial study, why is it the case that diets fail then and oh. what's the percentage success of a typical diet great well it's interesting uh something like six out of seven dieters lose weight so losing weight isn't isn't hard uh keeping it off is hard so long-term dietary adherence is what we like to measure and the main reason that people regain the weight uh, as i mentioned is hunger uh they just stop adhering to the diet they go back to their old habits they start over consuming and generally that food is the ultra processed hyper palatable foods uh and that is where none of us are any more successful than the other this is a whole conversation unto itself really that all of us in our diet tribes you know i have a named diet the vertical diet you know there's a whole host of people out there that claim that that they're whether it's intermittent fasting or keto or uh you name it None of us are any more successful than the other long term. There's been tons of studies on thousands of people for a year, two years. Uh, <clears throat> none of us can claim to have the answer to this problem. It's much bigger than all of us. And I, I think some of these ultra processed, hyper palatable food manufacturers are probably just laughing because we're all sitting around the table. There was an old Warner Brothers, uh, was it Warner Brothers? It was a cartoon when I was a kid. The ants were fighting over a cake. And there was a cherry on top and uh, you had the red ants and the black ants were up there and they were drawing around the cherry to see who was going to keep the cherry and they erase it and the other guy to erase it. And they got this great big fight. And then the, uh, the picnickers came back, picked up their cake and walked away while these guys were all fighting. I, f I feel like those ants in this, this uh, war on obesity. I was going to say, do you feel like there is a, a battle going on between the designers of food and the people who want to remain healthy? that battle is for money. That battle is for investors. That battle is to sell more food. That's what their job is as a corporation. Uh, and they'll design and sell and market and uh, in the most effective way to for their business to profit. 
not in in the most effective way to help people with their long term health and to you know stave off obesity. So that I can't speak to that. I'm, I'm just saying that while we're are arguing about the best diet, uh, it doesn't seem to matter. We all have our own list of testimonials. You know, I'd, I'll say something about the carbohydrate insulin model, but I'll go on to Jason Fung's uh, YouTube, and there's a whole bunch of people talking about how when they cut out carbs, they lost weight and they feel great. Uh, but in fact, everybody has testimonials. The vegan community has testimonials. The car carnivore community has testimonials. I post testimonials all the time. Um, doesn't seem to matter. Uh, that hasn't had an impact on our obesity crisis the the cause of our none of us are solving the cause of our obesity crisis which is access to uh, cheap affordable uh, ultra processed hyper palatable foods so it's bigger than all of us because none of us ha have any influence on that whatsoever that that uh, those companies that are manufacturing and distributing this food that's going to take a larger intervention like it did with smoking this episode is brought to you by a product i've used every single day for over three years now and that is ag1 ag1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that covers whole body health it is a staple part of my supplement regime i take the travel packs with me when i'm on the road like here in la and it really does make a massive difference especially to my digestion if your energy levels have been all over the place if you really feel like you need to make an improvement to your nutrition this is a fantastic place to start. It's been updated 52 times over the last decade and only uses the best ingredients at the highest quality to make sure that it covers all of your nutritional bases. There is a 90-day money-back guarantee. For 90 days, you can use Athletic Greens, and if you do not like it or are not satisfied with the results, they'll give you your money back. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 today by going to drinkag1.com slash Modern Wisdom, you'll get a year's free supply of vitamin D, five free AG1 travel packs, plus that 90-day money-back guarantee. That's drinkag1.com slash Modern Wisdom. So why is it the case, if what you've said with regards to the vertical diet is accurate, why is it not the case that the World Health Organization and the FDA are in alignment with this? Like, Why hasn't the FDA or the government updated or changed their recommendations in line with this? Uh, I don't know what recommendations you're necessarily specifically talking about. If you're talking about the dietary guidelines, those dietary guidelines are pretty good. Uh, they are, uh, I think people bastardized them when they went low fat. These uh, food companies came in and made these high sugar uh, uh, foods, but it's not the sugar. It's not the fat. It's the combination of all of those, sugar, fat, salt. It, it, it's a combination. That's where your pastries and, and cakes and all these things come from. They're not, it's not just sugar. Nobody's mainlining bags of sugar that's not how this works <laughs> there's someone there is someone out there, <laughs> there that's doing that Do you, sorry have you seen the videos of uh, these uh, uncontacted tribesmen and they give them cheesecake for the first time yeah, have you ever seen this i haven't seen it people should people yeah. after this it's episode has finished not now uh go and check out videos of uncontacted tribesmen yeah. eating cheesecake and obviously uh, their eyes just oh from an uh, orification yeah. so yeah. the design of yeah. the texture of food the the, yeah. the combination yeah. of the carbs and the fat and if you think about it i learned about orification a few years ago and it, yeah. it blew my mind um i learned so, about it in high school i'm not sure exactly what you're <laughs> i i didn't i look I, i'm i'm british we have a lot of fish and chips that add, i was and teasing poor orification. orification sounds like something to me sounds something else other than it's, it's <laughs> and come on it's a professional conversation <laughs> okay. legitimate scientific information about diet okay dragging us into the gutter orification the design of the texture of food think about ancestrally what you would have typically been able to have if you were eating anything it would have been yeah. one texture it's yeah. slimy meat it is right. uh berries which kind of if you get them at the right ripeness can kind of have a couple of textures a little bit of crunch on the outside but if you actually think about some of the most hyper palatable foods it's not just the flavor it's not just the actual content it's the texture in your mouth and this combination of crispy or crunchy with smooth is unbelievably novel yeah oreos got the crunch on the outside and that sort of smooth on the inside french fries sort of fluffy potato inside and the crunch that's well cooked on the outside cheesecake exactly the same yeah it's so novel and then when you layer on top it's not just that it's the spike of the sugar as it hits mm. your tongue and then after that it's the fat as well on top of this yeah. and yes yeah, sure enough you have these guys who've just been eating 
macaques or whatever they've been having for the you last- know what I immediately think of when you say that they tried it for the first time and they were just like, wow. I immediately think of the fact that that's what children experience at their initial consumption. And they no longer, we no longer experience that. It's normal to us when we eat those foods. It's almost expected. That's that's what we're drawn to. And we don't have that same response, but we just, we keep going back to those foods. You, it, it's, uh, you can't win that battle. We aren't winning that battle. We're losing that battle. And I guess that kind of brings us back to, you know, why isn't the World Health Organization, these other folks, they make some minor inroads. I think they got um, cereal companies to reduce the sugar, you know, with respect to kids. They got soda pops out of high schools and things like that. Very small. Um, places like Mexico, they, they started taxing sugar-laden beverages, but then they just, they go to an alternate source is what happens. Uh, they tend to, you know, they might just go to Kool-Aid instead of Coca-Cola. And that's generally what happens. So it's a, I'm not suggesting that I have a solution. I'm just saying I know what the problem is. We all know what the problem is. It's no secret. And even uh, people who suffer from obesity or, or overweight, it's not like they're confused about the fact that the foods that they're eating uh, are causing that problem. Uh, it's just the fact that it's just, it's too good, it's too affordable, too available. Uh, my wife grew up in, in Samoa. She was born and raised. In, um, in Western Samoa, which is British Samoa. The time she was born, so the time she was about six years old. She's got 12 brothers and sisters all older than her. And they grew all of their own food. They raised goats and chickens. They uh, would go out in the ocean and harvest whatever they could get from the sea. They grew uh, taro root. They had pineapple. Uh, and they would sell a lot of that at the marketplace, a very vibrant marketplace in Western Samoa. Uh, every week, you see three generations of family, uh, from the kids to the parents to the grandparents, uh, at marketplace selling whatever it is they were able to to grow and and put together for the weeks to to make money. They didn't have any obesity in their family. Grew all their own food, ate all their own whole foods. At some point, when she was about six years old, their whole family moved to American Samoa. And in American Samoa, they had food stamps, and they had big, huge stores with white flour, sugar, seed oils, salt. And those were the most affordable things to buy, obviously. They're the cheapest to make and ship over there. And that became the foundation of their diet. They stopped growing their own food. The marketplace in American Samoa is laughable in comparison. Nobody uh, cooks and, uh, or raises and cooks their own food. They became what I said, uh, food rich instead of food poor. They had food stamps and they had availability. Uh, and they started consuming all of those ultra-processed, hyper-palatable foods. All of her family, uh, the vast majority of them, ended up gaining a significant amount of weight. And her father ultimately died from complications of diabetes, the black feet and the whole nine yards. So uh, it, it's, I'm not suggesting I have a solution. I'm, it's pretty obvious what happened, what has happened. We just didn't have access to these these kinds of foods in as conveniently as this back in the 1950s. You look at those people always show those beach pictures in the 50s. Yeah, people, these are and super and popular no at the moment. Yeah, what's, yeah, really yeah. exciting, yeah, really popular. Uh, and none of those people are fat, or they show them in the 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 40s walking, you know, bustling up and down the streets of New York, and there's no fat people, and uh, it just didn't have access to this food environment that we have today. Uh, it's a calorie uh, problem. And it's the ultra processed foods that we're over consuming. So I don't, I mean, we're doing the best we can. I, I, I don't anymore, I don't claim to uh, be able to solve anything other than uh, the clients that I'm working with. You know, I try and put out good information, but um, we're all losing this battle miserably. Obesity uh, has, you know, our weight has continued to climb, insulin resistance has continued to climb, type 2 diabetes. Uh, I don't, and I don't see a solution uh, in the horizon because nobody's working on the actual problem. Uh, there's a lot of money involved in that. It, it probably would take some sort of governmental intervention uh, on a big scale. Uh, and I got a lot of blowback from this when I brought this up at a podcast previously. I, was, I got a tag saying, "Oh, it's personal responsibility," and I'm like, "Well, yes, it is, but how's that working out?" You know, uh, we're at some point we're going to have to find a better solution. And I, I yield to to. People who are, you know, a lot smarter and a lot more connected than me to try and uh, drive that agenda, but that's where we're at. How legit are the blue zone studies? A lot of problems with the blue zone studies. Uh, one in particular is the lack of 
uh, verifiable uh, birth certificates. A lot of these, a lot of these people would assume their parents. It's a registry issue. It's not a diet yes. issue. It's a registry issue. There, there, and there was a, a study done. I forget the name of the individual, but I actually included a reference to that in my. I have an ebook, a vertical diet ebook, where I've updated that periodically because I can, I can add. It's on version 3.0 currently and soon to be 4.0 on, on my website. But those are the kinds of links to research that I supply in there. And people ask me, what about blue zones? I've gotten this question. I've probably answered over 100,000 DMs in the last six or seven years. And a lot of those questions are the same, which is kind of what f f creates the foundation of, of, of the information that I provide. And I know in, that in this is what people want to know. This is what they ask. And so I, I pool those into most common questions and I endeavor to answer those so that, that they're covered. And then I refer people to those answers. But uh, one thing, yeah, we, we'd have a lack of verifiable. Um, there is a little cherry picking going on uh, with those studies. Um, I think that um, uh, some of the places that were left out, Iceland, uh, even in California, uh, the difference between, say, um, Seventh-day Adventists, is, is that the group that uh, that's vegan, that's in the, um, that's in the blue zones? Um, and I think right up the street, we've got Mormons who consume uh, significantly more meat, uh, but have the other lifestyle characteristics. They don't smoke, they don't drink, they exercise a lot, they're not overweight, have similar lifespans. And so uh, the blue zones are tough. Um, I think they make solid recommendations in terms of overall dietary patterns. Uh, but the idea that we can put a lot of weight uh, in, and those diets vary quite a bit. Uh, there's meat consumption in the in the Mediterranean diet. There's meat meat consumption in the Okinawans, ham in particular. Uh, so the Blue Zones was, I, I think, kind of an effort to go uh, to point more towards vegan. And in fact, a lot of those those lo those areas aren't vegan. Uh, a lot of meat, some meats in their diet, which again gets us back to dietary pattern. Fruits and vegetables uh, are very important. Uh, I think it's um, uh, Hong Kong, the highest red meat consumers in the world. Have some of the have longest lifespan, <laughs> uh, but they eat a ton of fruits and vegetables, and they eat pretty lean meats, and they don't suck down cubes of butter. Uh, so you know, all of that matters. What are some of the commonalities, either in terms of lifestyle, movement, diet, uh, social life, that you do think the blue zones do get right? Yeah, I think they get all of that right, uh, other than than trying to demonize a particular food item. I think they get all of that right. I think that they have better sleep. They have better uh, uh, body mass index, BMI, which is not the most accurate measure. Obviously, over-muscled people will look to be fat on BMI, but uh, they, have, uh, they, they move more uh, in terms of the number of steps that they accumulate every day. Um, and and you, you hit the nail on the head there too. They have uh, better, um, I think, social interaction with family uh, all of those things. Uh, it was interesting is that a lot of these zones were very poor, which lent itself well to, of course, not being very well documented and acquiring their parents' information so that they could uh, continue to receive any governmental assistance that was associated with that. Um, <clears throat> but usually lower socioeconomic um, uh, populations have less access to medical care and, and therefore maybe a shorter uh, lifespan, but uh, uh, that amongst all those other characteristics, that's uh, it's probably less important. What do you make of grounding and the usefulness of that in general overall health? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's meaningful. I, I, there's a lot of things. I, I try and stick with the big rocks, and I'm, I'm cautious about... Uh, there's a lot of folks more recently, and I don't mention any names, but they're popular folks that'll, that'll get into a lot of... Uh, they might dive into a plausible or possible reasons, biomechanical, you know, and the biochemistry and try and explain why something should work or could work. But they take these giant logical leaps and make these outcome oriented claims about things that uh, they, they just aren't meaningful when compared to the things that really matter, the, the sleep, maintaining the weight, exercising regularly, you, you know, you said the social uh, stress reduction uh, those kinds of things, uh, a healthy diet, everything else, I kind of put it into like a, the 99% and then the 1%, everything else kind of goes into that little 1%. A lot of it's placebo. <clears throat> this happens a lot in the, um, 
in uh, pain and pain rehabilitation. I talk a lot about this in my book. Um, a lot of that stuff, I say, generally speaking, things that are done to you or for you are never as effective as things you do for yourself. Active recovery, movement, right? Actually getting your heart rate up, exercising, lifting weights, those kinds of things. As opposed to massage. As opposed to massage. I'm not saying massage is, is not beneficial. I'm just saying that in comparison, uh, this isn't me, this is what the research suggests. I think to quote Greg Knuckles on it, he said that uh, for, for, this is a study on lower back pain, 95% of which resolves itself spontaneously within six to eight weeks. So any intervention that somebody with pain uh, submits themselves to chiropractics, physical therapy, electric stem, gua sha, uh, uh, dry needling. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Inversion table. Anything. Wearing a copper bracelet. It's Anyth coming along for the ride. Anything is coming along for the ride. They will attribute their spontaneous recovery to whatever intervention they're participating in at the time. Oh my God, that worked for me. It was fantastic. It's worked for thousands of other people. Uh, Greg's words were, to quote, he said, maybe it's better than nothing, but it pales in comparison to any kind of movement. It's not an indictment on physical therapists or chiropractors. It's, it's that they should be facilitators of movement. A good physical therapist, uh, Professor Michael Ray, uh, the folks at Barbell Medicine um, who uh, talk about the biopsychosocial method, which I think came from Lara Mar Mosley's work, Explain Pain out of Australia, they're on the front lines of this where manual therapy, uh, not as effective as, as movement. It's a, it's a facilitator of movement. If someone by touching you can uh, distract you from that pain signal from the brain to the location that you're experiencing pain, uh, call it placebo, call it distraction therapy, and that then allows you to move with less inhibition, Greg calls it uh, kinesophobic, uh, when people have pain, they they stop moving, which is exactly the opposite of what you want to do. You want to begin moving as early as possible and as much as possible with as little pain as possible. Uh, and that's what's going to help facilitate the recovery. So I didn't mean to get too far off track there, but that's uh, that's where I always end up when people talk about, this, this could be true of, of ice baths, you know, contrast showers. And, and I'm like, great, you know, if it makes you feel good, uh, do it by all means. If those things, uh, you know, uh, give you a an emotional or a uh, there's just no evidence that they provide a significant physiologically measurable benefit one of the other big movers sleep what is the relationship between sleep and weight loss yeah a few things one when you don't get sufficient sleep you have increased uh, ghrelin release which makes you hungry or makes you want to eat more you also have compromised insulin sensitivity uh, which uh, makes it a little easier for you to to gain weight. You, sorry, you've mentioned insulin sensitivity a couple of times today. Like, just high level, what's that? Yeah, we would say say pre diabetic or diabetic is that when you eat foods, your blood sugars elevate, and there's no place to store them because you're over fat. Your fat stores are full, and so you you can't put those there. Your muscles uh, maybe don't have sufficient muscle mass to, to store that there, and then that stays elevated. For an extended Not period good. of time. Right. Okay. Understood. So sleep, weight loss. Sleep does affect uh, insulin levels as well. We also find that uh, people who don't get sufficient sleep, when they start losing weight, they might lose uh, a, a disproportionate amount of muscle as opposed to fat. The body becomes stingy at preserving the fat. Uh, and so those are all things that can happen. Uh, other, other, it, Just being awake more hours in the day gives you another opportunity to get hungry and eat, <laughs> you know, sleep through one meal and you're probably better off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah wow. Whole host of benefits from uh, getting sufficient sleep. Would you say that sleep is more important than cardio for fat loss? Well, I did put it this way once. I said, if you're waking up at 4 a.m. to do your fasted cardio after only five hours of sleep, you're stepping over hundred dollar bills to pick up nickels. And that's been something I've said for many years. If somebody had, to me, I would, I would do the cardio later. Or I don't even really recommend cardio at all to most of my clients because it's a pretty significant departure from their standard lifestyle. And it might not be something they enjoy. It might not be very sustainable. And we see it has diminishing returns over time as your body kind of adapts to that stimulus and reduce, becomes more efficient and reduces the calorie it burns. I focus on non-exercise. 
And another thing is, is that too much exercise activity, particularly aggressive exercise activity, I'm not shitting on any of these forms. If the best exercise is the one you'll do, if you enjoy doing it, do it. Uh, but if somebody goes, starts crushing themselves, I, I call it battle ropes and burpees, thinking that they're going to burn calories just, you know, to, for fat loss, uh, a phenomenon called compensation takes over where you just go home and sit more and eat more because you're hungry. You know, you're tired. And you earned it. You yeah. just trained well. Hey, and you can burn 300 calories in one of those battle rope and burpee episodes and you can go home and have one piece of bread and negate all of your, all of your gains or losses, we should say. Uh, but I'm cautious about prescribing cardio for weight loss uh, for all of those reasons. Prescribe an extra hour's sleep instead? I'd prescribe an extra hour's sleep and more non-exercise activity. I just think that the barriers to entry, having to come home, get in your car, drive to the gym, do your cardio, I mean, we're too busy, especially if you've got a family and a career. That's, that's the first thing that gets sacrificed in that scenario. That's why I love the 10-minute walks because they're more convenient, more sustainable. I can attach them to an existing behavior, which as we know, uh, increases the likelihood that that new behavior will become a habit. Uh, they can be done anywhere at any time. Let's say it's the first time that somebody is hearing about walking as a significant performance enhancer. Yeah. What do we need to know? Frequency, structure, why is it working? What's the best way that you found to integrate it? How do you stick to it? Well, we see dramatic improvements in health span simply from going from 2,000 steps a day to 5,000 steps a day. We see um, a significant decline in, in blood pressure, uh, improvement in heart rate, all the health markers. It also improves satiety of all things, just walking somewhere in that, I want to say about five or 6,000 steps a day. You can get about 1,300 steps from a 10-minute walk. Uh, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that uh, moving periodically throughout the day, say 10 minutes three times a day, is more effective than 30 minutes once a day on, on all-cause mortality as well. Why? Uh, well, it seems that the sitting for an extended period of time actually does some damage and moving more frequently throughout the day, getting your heart rate up, and even if it's five minutes out of every hour while you're at, at work. You know, they got those standing desks or the bike desks and those kinds of things and just movement in general. Um, and then getting sufficient steps in. Now, we do see differences in uh, the intensity of that. You should, they should be deliberate. The heart rate should elevate a bit. I mean, we're not jogging. Uh, you don't necessarily have to, to be out of breath. Um, but we see the folks that can get their heart rate elevated just a little bit. You stay in you know, zone two, I think everybody's talking about now. Is it not such that you can't uh, still talk while you're doing it. Uh, so it should be deliberate. It's tough to get to zone two walking. Zone two whilst it's walking. Like a, like a 4.0. It's a quick pace. It's a decent pace. It's deliberate, and it should be. You're going to get better benefits from it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not cardiovascularly even, <laughs> even remotely competent, but for me, and I wear a whoop, I absolutely love it, um, I would need to be weight vested, yeah. or I would need to be moving yeah. at one hell of a clip. Yeah. For me, like speed walking. I would look silly. <laughs> To get to, to well, we properly get into zone. That's the neat thing about exercise in general and improving your health span is that when you go from what's described as the bottom quartile into say the fifty percent or above, that's where you see the majority of your health benefits. Yeah. Uh, so I think something is better than nothing, and then I try and f make that something into uh, something that's sustainable and easy to do. On the walk, this is something that I realized while I was talking to a friend. A friend moved into this gorgeous new apartment in Austin on West 7th Street. Mm -hmm. It's on the 23rd floor. He's got a view on three sides. He can see the sunrise and the sunset. It's amazing. If he wants to go for a walk, it takes him seven minutes to get downstairs because there's only three elevators for 1,500 people that live in yeah. this apartment block and so on and so forth. And I was like, dude, like, I, I love this place. And then where I live, I am, as soon as I put my Crocs on, I am about 15 seconds from a park. Yeah. yeah. And it's the first time I live, parents' house is like that back home. My house in Newcastle is kind of similar. And then this one's by far the closest. And it's such a hack. And it's an unseen cost yeah. of vertical living. 
I, I think. I mean, you know, I can go up and down the stairs, and you could take the stairs you for twenty three flights. You could you could but, do ten minutes of stairs. Yeah, which would be great. Yeah. But I mean, it's a, you're seeing a gray brick, dry stone. Well, that's another thing. It's getting not, exposed to sunlight. That's yeah, a whole other psychological sure. benefit, of course. Of course. Mm. As far as the walk goes, you know, I've traveled. I've been in. 12 countries in all 50 states and over 200 seminars in the last five years. And so I was in hotel to hotel, airport to airport. I use the opportunity to walk from security to the gate as a 10 minute walk. I use the opportunity at, uh, at baggage claim. I'm walking around in circles while people are standing there waiting for the baggage thing to go. Such and they're, a good hack. They're looking at me like it, I'm an idiot. My favorite thing, especially at airports, is get to the gate. Even if I'm an hour early, which I'm yeah. not usually. And walk. And, but have a look. Okay, is it, uh, is it going to leave early? Is it going to leave early? This is the actual gate. The gate's not down. Some secret escalator. There's a bunch yep. of these in London Heathrow. Yeah. Okay, right. I know where I need to go. And I'll just, if you do laps, if you do laps that are 10 minutes, you're never going to miss your flight yeah. because every, you know, you're never more than five minutes away from the gate. And sitting before you're going to be sitting uh, seems like an awful waste of time because you're going to get on that plane, you're going to be sitting for yep. Two, three, five, seven hours. You know, okay, so uh, three more things about walks. Yep. I like to prescribe them post-meal. They're twice as effective as metformin for preventing or reversing type 2 diabetes uh, because of their impact on postprandial glycemia, the after-meal blood sugar elevation and duration. Your muscles will uptake the glucose from that meal into glycogen in the absence of need of insulin. So you get less... Uh, sustained uh, elevated insulin. Uh, additionally, it helps your digestion. Uh, just the uh, yep, just the musculature, uh, the uh, uh, the enzymatic action, and the muscular contraction. Uh, all of those things are of great benefit. I also find that it helps a lot with people that are trying to recover from things like hips or knees, uh, just to get lots of movement. That's a, a whole. Well, it's other. also a cue, right? You're going to yeah. have at least two meals a day, sometimes three. Okay, so if you manage to get a morning walk upon waking, which I absolutely adore, yep. it's the most reliable part of a morning routine that's waxed and waned as my workload has changed. Yep. That has not changed. Uh, so for me, wake up, element in water, because I, I really enjoy the way that that makes me feel. Then walk 10, 15 minutes, get back. Okay, if I walk after the next two meals, there's my three. And if yep. I actually end up having three meals a day, okay, that's four. Yeah. Um, Something else that I noticed when wearing a continuous glucose monitor was that I could see in the data what was happening to yeah. my blood glucose of course. whilst yeah. going on that walk. Absolutely. Here's something to say. Well, last thing on 10-minute walks is that um, we find that, that when you do them after meals, again, they become a, a, a habit. Sometimes I'll go to a restaurant at night I took my daughter to dance class last night. There was a sushi place right right next door. I went and ate the sushi place. I walked out the door and I set my timer for 10 minutes. I started walking. Your feet had taken you before you'd even planned to do it almost. Yeah. You, you can leave any restaurant, set your clock for five minutes, walk down the street. When the alarm goes off, walk back, then get in your car. So these are really easy bite-sized, you know, what they call exercise snacks, I think. Is and what sort of an impact are you seeing? So we've extol the virtues of it and I live next to a park and I can be the kind of a dog pervert as well because there's quite a lot of dogs there and I love dogs. What are the uh, outcomes that you see between somebody that, that doesn't do this and then does, even for a normal, moderately healthy person? Yeah, all the research suggests the satiety benefit, the blood sugar control, uh, just like recharging your battery. You know, if you're at work and you've, you're sitting there for an extended period of time, you start to get tired. A lot of people think that posture contributes to soreness, back tightness, neck tightness. Well, they've studied people that use quote unquote good posture and poor posture. Uh, they have similar outcomes. Some of the good posture people had worse outcomes in, in terms of pain. It was really the duration of time that you stayed in any one position. It wasn't the position itself. And so the movement becomes pretty critical. We'll get back to talking to Stan in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Gymshark. Gymshark make the best sportswear that I've ever found. I absolutely love this fluoro color, which is cheating and making me look a lot more tanned than I actually am. Also, these studio shorts that I'm wearing here are the best menswear shorts 
that I've ever found. They're literally unbelievably comfortable. They last forever. They're sweat wicking. They're super lightweight. They wash and dry brilliantly. The length is perfect. Also, if you saw me on the Seabum vlog, you would have noticed I was wearing a graphic tee, which Gymshark is starting to get into. And I absolutely love the guy's stuff is phenomenal. The girl's stuff is amazing, even though I don't wear it that much. Best of all, there is a 30 day money back guarantee with free returns worldwide. Plus, they've just updated my product page with a brand new collection of stuff that I bought last week. So if you want to see all of the products that I use and recommend from Gymshark, head to bit.ly slash sharkwisdom and use the code MW10 at checkout. That's bit.ly slash sharkwisdom and MW10 at checkout. The other thing that I really found whilst, especially if I'm eating a large meal during the middle of the day, and sometimes I'll forget to eat or just have not had time to eat until maybe 1 or 2 p.m. Uh, and that big dump of food often causes my thoughts to be muddy. And I don't like that. I don't like the way that I feel when I don't have access. I'm not as nimble. Um, it's one of the things we didn't mention it earlier on. But certainly, you know, on the pro-intermittent fasting side, even if the autophagy and some of the claims and blah, blah, you're pretty sharp. Mentally, I do feel quite sharp when I do that. Or at least... I feel sharp if I avoid spiking my uh, blood sugar too early in the day. But if I do have this large meal, I'm like, I'm muddy, and maybe I've got to record in a little bit, and I've got to be on my game because Stan Effeting's coming or whatever. That walk really brings that back. I've got some Agreed. fresh air. I've got a ton of sunlight in my eyes. I, you know, I'm looking at uh, my... Um, the ocular focus is changing too. I'm looking at stuff in the distance. I'm looking at stuff up close. Getting out of my head. I'm reflecting don't take your phone, don't listen to the AirPods. I don't know what sort of concerns we have around Wi-Fi signals and non-ionizing radiation from AirPods. Uh, I am a, if that's the case, and my AirPods, uh, AirPods are a danger, I will be the first one to die because they are essentially glued to my ears. Yeah. Um, but that opportunity, a single decision downstream from it, there are so many things that happen uh, and I noticed as well, this was something uh, that you may have heard, Huberman has talked about this, and I noticed it on my morning walks that I was doing before Andrew Huberman said to do them, and then he backed me up. I found ambient anxiety if I woke up and I'd had a bad night's sleep, or there was something playing on my mind, decreased during the walk. And he talked about the lateral movement of the eyes whilst walking, whilst locomoting, being something that downregulates amygdala response. No idea if you've come across this, but I knew that my felt sense was, ah, I feel a bit more, hmm, yeah. I'm kind of, I kind of, everything's not quite as shit and, and, and terrifying as I thought it was. Yeah. Uh, and after doing the morning walk and you're looking, you got to cross the road, there's a cat, whatever, that helped. Yeah. I'm a pretty simple guy, you know, if it, if it, if it works, it works. Uh, I've had extraordinary results personally. And of course I've been talking about this for, I can't remember the first time Mark Bell and I discussed this probably seven, eight years ago on his uh, podcast. Uh, and the feedback I've gotten from it is extraordinary. I mentioned it, you know, recharges your battery. You mentioned a couple of things. Uh, first we were talking about blood sugars after, uh, and you mentioned you ate a big lunch. There seems to be more of this post meal sleepies associated with the size of the meal than necessarily the blood sugar uh, or the glycemic load, depending on the individual's insulin sensitivity. What's that due to? Stomach being full? Yeah, I mean, you just- You should the, lie the down. Work, the amount of blood that go, gets shunted to your stomach to handle uh, all that food. It, just, it, it seems that the size, when they, when they were studying the carbohydrate load as compared to just the calorie load, it seemed that the calories would, is what made you most tired. Uh, but moving after meals has a significant uh, impact on that. Type 1 diabetics, we've had extraordinary uh, results. These are insulin-dependent type 1 diabetics who avoid carbohydrates for obvious reasons, uh, and their workouts suffer. These are people who want to, to uh, lift weights or do uh, CrossFit uh, and have a high anaerobic uh, requirement. They'll ask what they can do to be able to improve their performance without compromising their 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 diabetes. And what we'll do is have them train after they eat. So now we can include carbohydrates in that meal, and then have them do all, if it's if it's weightlifting in particular. This has been the most successful for us. Uh, they'll just do 15 minutes or so of of weightlifting, 
uh, whether it's chest in the, after breakfast, shoulders after lunch, triceps <laughs> after dinner. That sounds like my ideal day, actually, yeah. Yeah, well, I got that from a uh, diabetes uh, doctor, actually, that was on, I think he was talking to Dr. Peter Atia some years ago, and he was discussing the research showed that uh, doing treadmill or a uh, step mill for 20 minutes after a meal cut their insulin dependency in half. They were able to reduce the total amount of insulin they used in half. And we started seeing that as well when we started doing that with our clients. Having Dude, even from a financial standpoint, a let alone the health standpoint, yeah. just look at how they cost. Yeah. And then you also mentioned sometimes you skip breakfast. We talked a little bit about dieting. I mentioned 78% of successful uh, dieters eat breakfast. There is some evidence that eating breakfast and skipping dinner would be the better of the options if you were going to intermittent fast and wanted to skip a particular meal for a host of reasons. One of which is, of course, when you wake up in the morning, your cortisol's high, your muscles haven't been fed in a long time. And so getting them protein is pretty important to start that muscle protein synthesis and the rebuilding process. Certainly more important for athletes or people who are concerned about you know building or maintaining lean body mass. Uh, another one is circadian rhythms. It seems there's some benefit uh, when eating breakfast and in, in, uh, how it helps you uh, in getting to sleep that night. Another one is uh, is uh, satiety. It seems that when you eat a larger breakfast, you're likely to be less hungry in subsequent meals. Another one is blood sugar. Postprandial glycemia, again, uh, is reduced, measurably reduced in subsequent meals. And so the old uh, it was the old saying, eat like a king for breakfast, a prince for lunch, and a pauper for dinner. Uh, seems to have some science behind it now for what we refer to as chrononutrition. One of the things that is a counter to that that I struggle with is my willpower is highest at sticking to my diet in the morning and lowest in the evening. Very few people wake up and eat a chocolate bar upon waking. Right. So... I think uh, back, you know, and carb backloading and skip loading was in. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that carb night, uh, one of the reasons that all of this stuff uh, yeah. appealed to me was it allowed me to do the sacrifice reward mentality boxed within a like a 16 hour period. Yeah. Right. Willpower's high in the morning. I'm not going to cheat on my diet. I'm going to get after this. And I get to the evening and I've still got 1,200 calories, 1,400 calories to go. And there is some cookies, yeah. but I have so much other food still to go in and uh, right. the cookies aren't so nice anymore. If I did the reverse, I did sometimes struggle with that. Yeah. He was the second order challenge. One of the most reliable ways for me to give myself a shit night's sleep is to eat late. Oh, yeah. I really struggle with being horizontal with a full stomach. I'm, yeah. Some people eat loads of food and they go, I, I got to lie down to digest this. Yeah. I require gravity. I need it to be pulled down from here down yeah. into my stomach. And I don't enjoy lying down. And dude, I, it, the time that I have, my old business partner would happily eat a meal, a, a, a full meal, a full dinner that we would go for 30 minutes before he was going to go to bed and wash it down with a coffee uh, because the guy... I don't know what he's made of. He's a father, a father of three with two dogs. Yeah. So I, I think he's built different to me. Um, I, can't, I can't do that. So I have two things going on. I have the willpower and I have the, the late night uh, disruption of my sleep yeah. due to being too full. In general terms, two meals a day or six meals a day, if you control for calories and protein, you get equivalent weight loss outcomes. In general terms, if you eat uh, a huge meal before bed, uh, and no breakfast, uh, same calories, same protein, you get similar outcomes. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing if that's your personal preference to eat a big dinner. I was just suggesting there are some other reasons why breakfast might be good. One of the things I left off of that list of satiety toolbox or tools that we have in our toolbox was the fact that it makes a lot of sense to get as many of those uh, snacks, those hyper palatable foods out of the house, the ice creams, whatever your kind of go-to is. Environment design. Yeah, now, there's some evidence to suggest that you shouldn't abstain from things that you enjoy uh, because you might binge and go off to your diet, but you should make them harder to obtain uh, if you can't. Uh, I've had clients that, you know, what's the, what's the Pringles? Once you pop, you can't stop. I've had clients who said they can't in, uh, keep certain foods in their diet because they'll overeat them. Hmm. Uh, and then other There's clients- There's no way that I can eat this in a moderate amount. Can't eat just one. So that's one strategy is to get all that stuff out of the house. But really important uh, piece of that is, is you have to replace it with something else. Fruit bowl. Uh, fruit I bowl. Massive fan of a fruit bowl. 
fat-free Greek yogurt with strawberries. It's, it's a pound of strawberries, I think, is only 120 calories. Fruit bowl, as in that's lots of fruit. Also, buy a bowl that you put fruit in. Yeah. That being visual, it being yeah. somewhere that is almost uh, borderline inconvenient. For you, you got, I got to get past that to yeah. get to the whatever. Um, for me, has been in everywhere that I've lived has made a massive difference. Yeah. And it's always, I always forget about it for six months and I don't buy it. And yeah. then I do. And yeah. there's always pears or there's always right. bananas or there's always whatever. Um, the same thing with the fridge, even like little things, putting the berries at the front of the fridge. Within reach. That's another one of those strategies. The, the, the food that's furthest away and as opposed to closer to you, these has all been studied to show that that's our behavior. I talked about barriers to entry. Uh, this would be uh, a barrier to access. A lot of people have taken sleep very seriously mm. over the last few years. Given that that is one of the long levers, what are the principles that you rely on when it comes to good sleep, optimizing sleep, preparing for it, doing it yeah, on the night? Yeah, there's a list of things that, uh, well, the big one is, is if you suffer from sleep apnea, which a lot of my large clients do, and I certainly have since uh, over the years when I got up to 300 pounds and the like, uh, if you suffer from sleep apnea, that's a killer. That'll raise your blood pressure, thicken your blood. It'll make it very hard to recover from workouts. There's a whole host of, of uh, potentially deadly um, uh, signs of, uh, or problems associated with sleep apnea. I was shocked when I worked with uh, Hofthor Bjornsson, Brian Shaw, Lane Johnson, Dan Green. The list goes on and on of people who were not wearing their CPAP. Who, uh, Had they know, been prescribed it? They had been prescribed in many cases, or others just who just hadn't done it. And you, you know, one quick question to their wife or significant other: Does he snore? And it's like, oh God! If you snore and wake up tired, there's a uh, there's a questionnaire that you can just Google. It's called Stop Bang S T O P Stop Bang questionnaire that you can a little quiz you can take to show what the likelihood is that you suffer from some degree of sleep apnea. Obviously, getting a sleep study is, is ideal. Uh, it could be very expensive and time-consuming, especially internationally. It can take many, many, many months to get into a doctor uh, for a sleep study internationally and more like I get from Canada and Australia and my clients from the UK. Um, and then when you do go in, if you don't have severe sleep apnea, they'll just tell you to lose weight because obviously it's very expensive to, to you know outfit you with a CPAP. Here in the States, uh, if you snore and wake up tired, there's a good chance, particularly if you have significant neck, neck girth, and that could be from being overweight or it could be neck from- girth. Neck girth, what a great girth. word. <laughs> I always reference uh, Dr. Jordan Fagenbaum from Barbell Medicine. Great uh, name. He's 198 pounds, and he wears a CPAP. He's got a thick neck. He squats a lot. So uh, it, it's related to, to neck girth and uh, the, uh, the closing of the airway at night when you sleep. If you have some degree of sleep apnea, the CPAP, uh, first and foremost, needs to be the first thing that you do. And if uh, if you don't have a doctor, you're not insured, you can't afford the expense of that, they actually do resell these on on Craigslist. And I have a, a provider that uh, that refurbishes them and and uh, and I provide my clients with them. It's that important, uh, particularly if there's a, a cost as an issue. Now, there's good sleep hygiene all the stuff most people have heard about. First and foremost, give yourself an opportunity to be successful. You know, people are burning the candle at both ends. They go to bed late and then they're scrolling through their feed and then it's up midnight, one o'clock in the morning and they got to get up at 6 a.m. You just haven't even given yourself an opportunity to be successful. I set my alarm to go to bed, not to wake up in the morning so that about an hour before I'm supposed to sleep, I know to start shutting things down. Uh, you want to wake up at the same time every morning, get exposed to sunlight. That helps start your circadian rhythms for the day and your melatonin and all that and start building up sleep pressure. Cool room, quiet room, dark room, all those things, whether it's blackout blinds, a separate air conditioning unit, all of those things. If you have uh, a dog that sleeps in the bed or you know somebody that comes in later and, and, and dis disrupts you, that's all going to interfere with the quality of your sleep. Blue light, that would be TV and phone, obviously. You know, electronics are, are huge. After that, there's you know, some smaller things, like you mentioned, not, uh, or not eating too close to bed, not drinking too much or having too much caffeine uh, as you get close to bedtime. Um, <clears throat> another one might be, uh, I'm just kind of trying to run down all the things that are associated with good sleep. <sighs> They'll come to me, but it, 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 that's kind of the main checklist. I have a, I have a, uh, a sleep hygiene uh, chapter in my book, of course, and I, I send that to my uh, 
that's the biggest thing. And that's why I have them send me the hours of sleep every morning. And I ask them how are their energy levels because that, that's usually the reason why. A lot of people, I think, are struggling to fall asleep. Even the ones who've taken the red pill of you need to sleep with your phone outside of your bedroom. Yeah. Um, but there is a there's a difficulty that I, I hear from a lot of people that they wish that they could fall asleep more easily, and that you know they go to bed maybe even early and they're tossing and turning. The temperature's good. The room is black and cool. Yeah. And I'm just tossing and turning and tossing and turning and I can't yeah. go to sleep. What would your advice be to someone that's struggling to fall asleep on well, a night? Now time? it might be somewhat individualistic. Uh, now it might be that some people, some, some keto people find that they have a hard time sleeping. There might be some uh, benefit to having a little bit of carbohydrates before bed uh, for some folks or with your dinner it might help you sleep. Uh, we find oftentimes that as cortisol elevates throughout the night from a low carb diet, um, that's usually because it's stimulating the liver to release glucose. You see high fasted glucose in the morning uh, on keto diets sometimes and high cortisol in the morning. So it could be influenced by your diet. Uh, there's some evidence that maybe taking glycine, uh, and again, it's very individualistic and it's not, it's not really well, um, it's not really universal in the literature. Uh, so it, it, at that point, we're kind of, you know, we're spitballing trying, yep. to, trying to pinpoint some problem. I had, throughout almost all of my 20s, a very inconsistent sleep and wake pattern. In fact, COVID was the first time as an adult that I ever went to bed and woke up at the same time. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Uh, because we were running these nightclubs, and it would mean that one night I'd try to go to bed at 11, and another night I wouldn't get in from work until 5 a.m. because I was in Manchester, and I had to drive back, and it was yeah. two and a half hours. And I'm like doing this intense thing, trying not to crash and die. And then especially since being in Austin and since having the show, which allows me to lean my workload even further this way, uh, I've dialed in my wake time and my body knows to raise me at 6.59. And I can turn over and look at the clock at yeah. 6.58 and see it turn in the radial command. Yeah. The problem is we're on Pacific time. Right. So yesterday morning, I was in Vegas recording a big episode. I fly in. The flight's delayed. We haven't eaten. I'm tired. I'm stressed. Get to bed. It's midnight, one in the morning. Five a.m. Up at four fifty nine. Four fifty nine up. Yeah. This morning, same thing again. Uh, so I don't disagree. The you know the beauty of waking up, knowing that this is the time to wake up, feels yeah. kind of freewheeling to be able to do it that rigidity your body unfortunately doesn't have the adjustment no, uh, clock no. when you've got to get yourself it, into a new yeah, time it zone might move an hour a day yeah. and so it could take you like if you fly out when i flew to australia i was exhausted for the whole week and when i flew to kuwait i was exhausted for the whole week i was a walking zombie during the day i had a a debate in qatar at the start of this year which isn't out yet but it will be eventually and um the guy that i was uh debating my other side was uh he didn't sleep at all the night before yeah. and i think i'd managed to get i'd fluked four hours or five hours of sleep yeah and i thought oh god this is going to be really really difficult and then he came in he was like dude i didn't sleep last night and i was like oh i feel brilliant <laughs> it's his unfair advantage anything, yeah um but yeah i'd i departed la at 4 p.m and arrived in qatar 6 p.m. the next day, right. having been on a plane for 15 hours or yeah. something. Um, I also did, a, in November last year, Johannesburg to Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, which was one hell of a, where, what year is this? Where have, where have I been? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, travel's, travel's an interesting one, especially when you've got sleep dialed in. It's actually, in some ways, less flexible. It's more rigid. I did a video called uh, Why I'm a Hypocrite. Because when I was competing at a very high level, uh, I had the time and the resources and the coaches. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have kids. Uh, and it's all I did was eat, sleep, and train. And then as I travel around and I talk to people, whether it's uh, you know online or what have you, and you've got nurses and doctors and police, fire, and ambulance, and people working shift work and the like, it's very easy for me to, to sit here and talk about good sleep hygiene, but those are challenging. Newborns, yeah. you know, a yeah. couple of yeah. kids, uh, those yeah. are all conditions that 
are, are hardly controllable. There's a very visceral response that I see reliably online from parents that have got young kids. And I, I really do understand. I, mean, I can't, I don't fully understand, but I, I can tell that um, it's not a resentment of the child. It's not, but it's a, it's a wistfulness for a bliss of sleep that yeah. feels like a bygone era. And, you know, if you end up having two kids or three kids and they're one or two years apart, it's like, guess what? You're locked in for the best part of the next decade yeah. with this suboptimal sleep. And then when you finally train this child to be able to go to bed, another one arrives yeah. and it was your fault and you love it. And it's wrecked your sleep yeah. all over again. So I, yeah. you know, I, I really do, I really do, um, I feel for parents. I mean, the World Health Organization classes any type of shift work as a health risk. Yeah. That's petrol pump station attendant, uh, checkout cashiers yeah. that work night shift. That's firefighters. That's nurses. Yeah. Uh, dude, it's, uh, you know, it's rough. And that was me. That was me for 15 years. That was my video guy, my video guy taking, yeah. um, doing nightclub photography and then we expect the album to be up the next day by midday so guess what he's getting in staring at the screen right so that he can make sure that photos of 18 year olds drinking budweiser are available for us the next morning is it's yeah it's tragic I, some of the feedback i get uh, from firemen uh, like i mentioned police fire and ambulance and nurses and the like who work those long hours and those long shifts doctors I mean, how is that even safe? Uh, Did you see, was it Matthew Walker's book? The percentage of doctors or surgeons who work particularly extended shifts and then get in their car to drive home and then arrive back at the same hospital having just been in an accident. It's like a non-insignificant right. number of doctors and surgeons. Well, I think surgeons. it was, it was uh, Matthew Walker also talked about how they were able to predict win-loss percentages in basketball games based on uh, looking at the sleep schedule, not knowing the teams. Wow. But just looking at when they were doing back-to-back -back East Coast, West Coast travel and just looking at who was going to lose the most sleep. They had like a 78% uh, win-loss accurate guess. Uh, and I think that, at least as I understand it from the study, is that that prompted, uh, maybe it was LeBron at the time, to go into the... Um, uh, players union and say, look, we need to fix this. So this uh, out. It was like f four games in five days and they were East coast, West coast and stuff like that it was increasing injury risk. Yeah. Like hell. Problem. I mean, I think I, I ruptured an Achilles three years ago playing cricket, a gentleman's yeah. way to do it. And, uh, I can't remember how good my night's sleep was leading up to it. And I wish I could, I actually could probably maybe even go into the, maybe I have my whip data, maybe go in and have a look, but I bet it was shit. Yeah, I bet it wasn't on point. It was the back end of coming out of COVID. I was probably doing things and seeing friends again and stuff. It was all over the place. Okay, so the the sort of the third pillar we've spoken about diet, we've spoken about sleep training. Having done every different modality known to man, when it comes to training for muscle growth, training for lean lean body, looking good, with a balance in health, what are the principles? that the best training programs rely on? Reps, duration, rest, intensity, frequency, all that yeah. stuff. Well, there's a lot of it. And you're, 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 there's a list, uh, just as you mentioned. Obviously, you'd like to do some cardiovascular work and some resistance training for the muscles. I think they complement each other in, in many ways. The 10-minute walks could probably satisfy a lot of that, maybe doing a couple of hit sessions. Uh, I actually do a brief hit session before leg day just because it really helps warm me up and gets my, I'll do it on a bike. I'll do it on one of those uh, Aerodyne uh, bikes or assault torture, bikes. Tor torture machine. Yeah. And that, that enables me to get my hips and knees through a range of motion. Uh, as we age, we lose a little bit of our explosiveness, our power, our speed. Uh, that helps me keep uh, stimulating that, that, uh, that particular uh, <clears throat> training stimulus. So now we're down to weight training. And again, the best exercise is the one you'll do. I, I want people to consistently do some sort of exercise, but loading uh, becomes really important as you've seen in a lot of the uh, longevity folks. I think Peter T has been real prominent in, uh, in that. Of course, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons talking a lot about the importance of muscle. And, you know, we as bodybuilders and powerlifters, of course, we're just uh, kind of, um, I think, soaking it all in because we've loved lifting weights for all this time. I don't presume to think that everybody loves lifting weights. And so one of my first challenges is, is to, to 
find exercises that they enjoy doing, so they'll do them for consistently. And, and that that can be a challenge, you know, depending on who the individual is, what their experience is with lifting. Because that I love, you know, exerting that effort and getting the pump and some people might find that to be almost physically painful to the point where they just uh, they just don't want to do it but you can do reasonably little you know it's kind of like I like a 10 minute walks as opposed to 40 minute cardio sessions on a treadmill uh, you can do reasonably little and make significant progress particularly as a as a beginner and by that I mean if you could get to the gym twice a week uh, and you wouldn't even necessarily have to go to the gym as a beginner you could do some push-ups uh, you could do some kind of modified chin-ups, uh, maybe not on a bar above, but just kind of laying in a plank position, doing some chin-ups and some air squats. That'd be a heck of a start. Um, and if you could start to use your body resistance twice a week, full body, be fine. Now, eventually you're going to graduate to the point where, uh, hopefully you enjoy it enough and you actually want to build some muscle. I think that's most of the people here. The training age will be at least mm -hmm. moderately mature. Yeah. They'll be good amateur at understanding how to be a bro. Yeah. In my book, uh, I supply what's called an evidence-based guidelines for hypertrophy that I uh, shoplifted from uh, Brett Contreras, PhD. I put his name on it. I, I'm happy to give credit. Uh, but he does an excellent job of summarizing uh, a lot of the research that uh, comes out of Brad Schoenfeld's uh, organization. Brad's probably one of the most uh, prolific researchers in, in uh, hypertrophy. And there is a list. There's a pretty significant list. Uh, one people always ask about is frequency. How often do I need to train? And generally speaking, twice, train a body part about twice a week. Um, so you could go in on Monday or Friday, or you go in on Wednesday or Saturday. You know, for busy folks who work all week, I might have them do a, a, a small session uh, on one evening of the week and then have them do a longer session on the weekend. Or you could go Saturday, Sunday, skip Monday through Friday. I mean, it doesn't seem to matter all that much. Um, but you want to train every body part twice a week. Try and get at least 10 to 20 sets per body part per week. That's working sets, not including warm-up. That would be working sets. And so that's five sets of chest on Monday, five sets of chest on Friday. Let's just assume we're setting up a, a full body workout. And then five sets of, of uh, say, some back exercise, push-pull legs. Five sets of chest, five sets of back, five sets of legs. Do that twice a week. You could make gains on that. Uh, eventually if you needed to increase your volume and there was a time constraint for how long you could spend in the gym in that given hour, maybe you add an extra session that week. Currently I train, uh, upper body day off, lower body day off. And I repeat that. So I'm on an eight day split. So I work everything every eight days. So I'm not training things on the same day every week. It changes. Uh, but that suits me because at my age and with the intensity that I still lift, I need a little more recovery. I, Talk to me about intensity. Uh, that would be kind of next on the list. So we now know, we know how many times a week to train and we know about how many sets to do. Uh, well, let's hit reps real quick. Reps is going to be, um, it doesn't seem to matter anywhere from <laughs> five to 30. As long as you lift it within a rep or two of failure, you can get hypertrophy, equivalent hypertrophy outcomes. Phil Heath sat in that seat yesterday. Yeah. And he was saying regularly he would go to 20 reps. Yeah. And I said, dude, I've been told that anything over 14 is cardio. Yeah. It's like, who's telling you that? In our industry, Phil actually got picked on a little bit because, you know, Ronnie Coleman was the, was the one who lifted really, really heavy weights. And Phil always lifted lighter weights. Uh, and Phil had equivalent hypertrophy outcomes. Phil was an extraordinary Mr. Olympia. And he did not do a ton of super heavy stuff. Uh, Dorian lifted reasonably heavy, but he still lifted in, in the 10 to 12 rep range. And he found that in his younger years, when he was trying to lift heavy, uh, like with squats, he actually started getting injured. And so there is a greater injury potential. There is more fatigue accumulated at the five rep range. You also get stronger, but strength is not the primary driver of, of hypertrophy. They're two very different things. Uh, I found throughout my career competing in both bodybuilding and powerlifting that powerlifting didn't necessarily help bodybuilding very much. Those those big single rep exercises recruiting multiple muscles. There's something else to say about the difference between a one RM and an 85% RM. 100%. To, yeah, very different. Which, some people's strength curves are that their uh, two rep max and their three rep max aren't that far off where their one rep max is. Uh, that's me. Yeah. Other people. I have a number of friends in the UK. Johnny is one of them whose two rep max is like not even in the same universe yeah. as his one rep max. Yeah. 
So trying to work off of percentages, which is why the RPE revolution was, I think, very useful. Yeah. Um, that going off, how difficult does this feel? Leveled the playing field for precisely this problem. Yeah. So if you lift a really heavy weight, say 85% of your one rep max for five reps, and you might have been able to get six, uh, that's going to give you equivalent hypertrophy outcome. If you lift 50% of your one rep max for 30 reps, and you probably couldn't have gotten 32. Is that any difference? There isn't really any difference other than the strength component. You'll get stronger at the five. You probably accumulate more fatigue at the five. CNS. CNS. And that's important though, because in terms of strength, part of that is specific. Part of that is nervous system's ability to handle the load. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is, that kind of handles reps and intensity uh, because the intensity is get within a rep or two of failure. If you do 10 reps and you could have done 20, likely not a sufficient stimulus to give you a hypertrophy result. Why not go to failure all the time? Why not do get to 12, drop down, rest pause, myo reps? Doesn't appear to give you any more benefit. Might even in terms of powerlifting be a deficit, be a decline in, in performance. Uh, increases fatigue, which will reduce, which will increase DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness which might impair your volume and frequency over time because over in time. three days time when you've Probably got to go back in that do... single workout and when you'll be able to train how soon you'll be able to train again so it doesn't seem to be necessary can be detrimental if you're a little more patient leave a rep or two in the tank it's not what you do in any one workout. You've probably seen the videos on Instagram. I can't remember who started them. Said, if you go to the gym and work out and you come home and look in the mirror, you'll see nothing. <laughs> you know, and, you, and, and he goes on to say, you know, do it the next day. You'll see nothing. Uh, it's the cumulative effect of being consistent and progressing this uh, training over time that's going to start to, you'll start to see small gains. And so be cautious how much you invest into any one workout. And at the same time, be cautious of junk volume. I mentioned if you're doing 10 reps and you could have done 20, uh, that's not a sufficient stimulus. That would be considered to be junk volume, not getting any return on that investment. Rest. Exercise. What about training. rest? Rest periods are interesting. Uh, it seems that you get better hypertrophy from longer rests. And the comparison here was, again, Schoenfeld's study between one minute and two to three minutes. Uh, it seems there are some substrates that are depleted and then replenish. After you do a hard set. ATP or something else? Yeah, creatine phosphate, you know, the creatine phosphate system, getting those creatine phosphate stores replenished, uh, getting the acid to dissipate. There's the lactate buildup and causing the hydrogen ion, getting that. And then the nervous system to be able to um, adapt and, and come back and do another set. The goal would be that you could, that you wouldn't have such a significant decline in repetition set after set after set uh, because it might be more, uh, it, it might, be less related to must to mechanical tension and more a matter of um, those substrate depletions or uh, it could be a cardiovascular insufficiency maybe you just aren't able to uh, recover fast enough because you cardiovascularly stressed now the real money maker tempo time under tension is it bullshit or is it legit uh yes and no that's <laughs> it's always yes and no. You can go too fast and you can go too slow. Okay. Seems two to five seconds is a pretty good range of time. You, you want to control the negative. Uh, two to five seconds from rep to rep. Two to five seconds yeah, deep. Two seconds down. Yep. Uh, and then uh, and then understood. Do the uh, concentric portion of the movement. Five seconds down is brutal. Five seconds down is relatively slow. But we seem to get the same result in that range. You okay. start getting north of five seconds, and uh, you see probably a more of a fatigue to stimulus ratio. It's ten seconds doesn't give you any more benefit than five. So control the negative would be what would be important there. What is it? Because the uh, eccentric portion of the movement is the one that is supposed to grow the most muscle? Is that scientifically backed? They're both important. There is some benefit to it. I'm not sure if uh, you could you could say it does potentially create the most damage. Uh, it is, it's an essential part of, uh, of the movement, obviously. Um, but it seems that damage is not a driver of hypertrophy. It's kind of a passenger. Uh, mm. The mechanical tension is important. It, it seems that it, it's just associated, if you're training hard, you're probably going to have some soreness. Understood. So I've, I've asked this question of Ryan Terry. Real quickly, yep. you can get sore running a 5K, you're not going to build any muscle. Uh, so, and you can get sore 
doing new exercises all the time, right? Uh, because you're so not adapted. I'm saying a soreness doesn't necessarily provide I mean, a sufficient, is an indic indicative of having performed a sufficient hypertrophy exercise. Uh, because again, you go around a 5K, your, your legs aren't going to get any bigger. You're not going to grow from, from hypertrophy. And if you do a bunch of different exercises every time you come in, the whole P90X thing, yep. uh, just from what we call a novel stimulus, you're going to be sore, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's going to improve hypertrophy outcomes. How many times have you taken a break from training, extended break, yeah. you come back- Do the same thing you did before. And you can't straighten your arms. No, yeah. For a week. Yeah. You go, oh, I guess like this is my life now. Like this yeah. is just me for the next seven days. Right. Yeah, that, that'll happen. That's a detraining effect. And when you get when you come back. Now, of course, if you do that again in three days and again three days later, the same exercises with the same amount of sets and reps and weight, you're gonna have a lot less soreness. Your body will adapt to that. So I've asked this question of Ryan Terry, Phil Heath, and Chris Bumstead. If you only had 10 exercises for the rest of time to build and maintain as much muscle as possible, what would you choose? Uh, I'd have to <clears throat> choose a push pull and a legs and i'd probably throw a hamstring in there so that's going to be four and i maybe get two of each so i'm looking let's at get a, specific what would I'm it be looking at a at a squat movement barbell uh, back squat front squat smith machine uh, all of them you can only have one stand i'm limiting thing. if i've got I'm, a barbell i can back this squat, is my game squat, these are my rules squat, front squat no these I are can, my I rules this is that. stop breaking the game yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you for me personally, because I use a lot, because of my anthropometry, my uh, my long femur length as compared to, yep. uh, I would probably need to do a high bar squat to, to effectively train my quads. Uh, so my glutes are preferentially developed from a low bar squat. So high bar squat would be a big one for me. Yep. Uh, my favorite hamstring exercise is, uh, I love the, uh, the uh, Cambered Bar Good Morning it's one of my favorites. You go on Instagram, uh, crushing the good morning. And that's where you put the weight up here and you, you bend forward and try and keep your legs relatively straight. It's for hamstrings. Why the cambered bar? Uh, for me, I just find that it puts more of the stress on the hamstrings as opposed to the lumbar. Uh, By bringing that moment arm a little yeah, bit lower I'm down. Yeah, I'm able to pull the, the camber back just a little bit here yep. rather than having it. The further the bar sits, uh, we call the moment arm, from uh, the, the glutes, uh, you know, from uh, where, where your body's trying to, uh, uh, your back and, and is trying to uh, adjust the movement, uh, the more stress that's going to put on, on the A little bit bar. less axial load. Yeah. Do Dr. Stu McGill will be happy. Okay, so yeah. we've got a high bar back squat. Yeah, um, bar. Yep, and um, we've got that. So we've got leg, legs are pretty smoked. Yep, legs are pretty smoked. I would put in one more quad exercise, and, and it would probably be a, a unilateral movement. So it would probably be, a, which could be either a single leg leg press, a walking lunge, or a Bulgarian split squat. I kind of like the Bulgarian split squat the best because I can do re repeat repetitions with the same leg. I like that You're as opposed savvy. to. I hate Bulgarian split squats. And that's why I like them. Is this, uh, <laughs> because <laughs> because there's, there's. You're a psychopath, uh, that's why. Yeah, the things, the hard shit always works better than the easy shit. That's, that's why I'm picking these exercises. In with mind. that. Have you got a preference for how you would do that? Were you holding dumbbells? Would you have barbell on back? Um, the loading? I would probably hold dumbbells with those, yeah. Barbell on the back is kind of an awkward setup. Uh, now we're going to move to a chest exercise. Uh, I like the incline dumbbell press, uh, just a slight incline dumbbell press. Uh, I did a lot of heavy benching in my career, and I, I'd never built my pecs as well as when I trained with Flex Wheeler using incline dumbbell presses. Uh, they allow more depth and they allow independent rotation of the shoulders. So I get less potential shoulder injury. What are the cues that you're thinking of or that you're telling your clients when you're looking at the incline dumbbell press? This is the 45 one. 45 degree angle of the elbow. This is the one exercise so far that every single person has had in. And no one's had flat bench dumbbell right. press. Right. Uh, so it's something that a lot of people Slide seem to be using. Line, trying to get up here a little more. Yep, 45 degree angle yep. on the arms. Deep elbow, trying to wrap that pec around the rib cage as best you can. I don't want to be out here. It's going to hit the shoulder. I want to be in here, so it's the pec. And I want to use that rib cage. So in order to do that, I'm going to actually lift my sternum up and expand the rib cage. And then the deeper I can get my elbow, use that. Because you want to have as much lengthening of the of the chest muscle or any muscle that you train as possible uh, it's going to grow better in the lengthened position full range of motion okay there's 
five. <laughs> Is that where we're at? I think that's four. I think I had a, I had a high squat. bar back squat. I good had morning. A, good morning. You're right. The yep. quad, you had the uh, Romanian. No, you didn't. You had the uh, Bulgarian split squat. Bulgarian split squat. Yep. Incline. And then we jumped on to incline for the chest. Yep. Um, <clears throat> next one on chest, I would probably do. Uh, oh, I just love that incline barbell, incline dumbbell so much. Uh, some people like to do flies. I'm not a big fan of flies. Uh, might throw a dip in there because I'm going to hit some tricep mm. at the same time too. So I get mm. a nice deep. Yeah, what are you thinking cues for dips? Work on the dip. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, if I'm working triceps, I'm trying to keep my feet underneath me. If I'm working chest, I'm trying to keep my chest forward. And again, again, trying to wrap that, that pec around the- Weight belt if you need to increase resistance. Yeah, just hang weights on if you need to increase resistance. Uh, I have to throw another one for hamstrings. I had a hip hinge. I have to have a, a knee hinge. And so I'm going to do any standing, lying, seated. I like seated preferentially because uh, usually on the standing curl and on the lying curl, the weight stack bottoms out before you get full extension, before you, the hamstring really gets stretched. Yes, because you're a, if, if you're lying down, it's going to like rip you up off the machine. Yeah. When you bring the weights down, the stack usually bottoms out. Yeah. And so on the seated curl you've locked yourself speaking, in and you've lifted those in, feet especially up if you lean forward on it you can you can get a full extension and not bottom the weight stack out yeah so that give you your best length and position first time that i ever had the lean forward cue was alex homozi in vegas yeah. and his training vlog is about to be released at some point on the internet right. and you will see him take me through okay so sit back okay now flex feet okay now sit forward now push toes yeah. and the difference is that's why i was in pain flying home the next day yeah because of the doms yeah uh that's going to take us to a back exercise i'm going to do a chin uh chin up and i don't care do i have to pick one yeah underhand overhand let's get specific i've got to be specific about it i would probably do reverse grip mainly because i could get more bicep out of it so i'm getting a little extra benefit um, and then I'm going to do, I like the chest supported row. I used to do a lot of T-bar row, which really helped my deadlift. Um, uh, but it was, a, it was a lot of cheating. The range of motion is not as good. Meaning the extending the weight isn't nearly as good. You're pulling on your lumbar by the time you get that weight extended. So chest supported, but not seal row, not, uh, or not a, uh, completely flat. Would you be? It could be. I mean, some of the chest supported rows are angled and some yep. of the chest supported rows are flat, yep. but I like those. They're lower fatigue. I can do more volume there. Generally back you can train with a lot of volume and you've usually got a, a number of handles that you can mess around with on one of those yeah the the one we have currently is uh, has an adjustable handle so you can the width and it spins so those are those are uh, any any chest supported row is going to give you the advantage of not having to stress your lumbar doing bent rows or yes. yeah. uh, t-bar rows which uh, i think just what, gives, are we, what are we working here yeah that's my point uh, and one of the best things, of course, for all the muscle groups is to get a full extension. And when you're doing that with a, a bent row or a T-bar row, you're going to get, you're going to put a lot of stress on the lumbar spine. Yep. That's what I found. Yep. It was great when I was powerlifting, you know, and it, it, that kind of thing transfers over well to a strong deadlift, but um, just for back training. So those are my two back exercises. Um, <clears throat> I like a Viking press and a side lateral. What's a Viking press? Uh, that's a, a standing shoulder press. Uh, I can't it's shoulder pivoted. a bar. It's pivoted on the thing in yes. front of you. Yep. Yep. I, I can't shoulder a bar. I don't have the flexibility. And so by the time I get all back here, now I've got my, you know, my back all bent. Yeah. And so this becomes uh so you wouldn't difficult. want to do a standing barbell press from a rack or whatever. You would rather go neutral with this Viking press. Yeah, the handle doesn't concern me. It could be it could be a normal grip or yep. neutral. Uh would be that one. And then side lateral. Side lateral raise would be a good one. I think I topped out at 10. I didn't even hit arms yet. I got, uh, but I got my biceps in my curl and I got my triceps in my uh, dips and in my dips. Now, the only one that leaves is calves. I've always struggled with calves. I'm actually looking to start a class action lawsuit against the manufacturers of calf machines because they clearly don't work. I think it's false advertising. I've been using those things for 30 years <laughs> and I'm still part of the no calf crew. And uh, so, yeah, but if, if you had to, you know, if I was given the option, I would throw in a a seated calf in particular for the soleus. Yes. Is there any truth in the uh, 
the size of your calves is more determined by your genetics than any other part of the body? Yeah, I think it's true of all muscles, though. Uh, it, <laughs> right. it, it really is. Okay. Yeah, I'll see. Uh, yeah. I mean, my wife's Samoan, so a lot of a lot of the uh, men in her community and women, by the way, have great calves, <laughs> and they never train them. Uh, a lot of it's just kind of how much weight you put on them and and how you walk. Um, I see some people with some pretty big calves that never trained them. It's frustrating. You're a partner with Marik Health. Yes, indeed. So am I. Yeah. First time that I've ever had consistent blood work done. Yeah. What are the lead markers, not just from Marek in terms of blood work? Yeah. Sat down with Dr. Peter Atia, and he's talking about uh, there is no single metric more important or more predictive of longevity than your VO2 max. I was like, where did this come from? And VO2 max, I'm hearing everything about zone two, yeah. you know, slow and long training. Yeah. Um, generally, what do you think are some of the metrics that people are, I think everyone's optimizing because of wearables. Everybody's optimizing for HRV now. Everybody's optimizing for breath rate and for resting heart rate. Yeah. Um, what would you, if you could say, these are some things that you should watch out for a little bit more than you do, whether it be blood profile or, or, or other markers. What, what should people focus yeah, on? Yeah, well, the blood profile is different, obviously, than the VO2 max. Uh, I think Dr. Peter T is right about that, that your cardiovascular fitness is going to be a pretty good predictor of, of lifespan and health span. Uh, I think it has more to do with it. It demonstrates uh, just how active you've been uh, throughout your life. You say the same thing about strength. Remember, they were doing all those grip strength studies showing that those with the higher grip strength that everybody was running around doing uh, grippers <laughs> and static That's hangs. the wrong <laughs> yeah. correlation. It's not working it, in the right it's way. A, it's a proxy for general strength. And, yeah. um, and even that general strength is a proxy for uh, just having uh, lifted for many years uh, heavy weights uh, or maybe your job was such that it required you to, yeah. to do it's some a byproduct. It's a byproduct as is cardiovascular. And if you're uh, you know, participate in any exercise consistently for an extended period of time, you're going to have a good lifespan. <laughs> you know, well. we said that uh, no one flukes uh, one gram per kilo of body weight. Like, no one flukes a high VO2 max. No one flukes right. high right. hand grip strength. You can't strength. hack it. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's not something you could take in a pill or a potion or a powder. It's, it's something you have to earn. And that's uh, it's kind of the frustrating part when people come to you for uh, some advice on longevity and it's like, well, you just got to work harder. And, and it's, no, I didn't mean uh, that. I meant, what yeah. do I take? Yeah. Uh, okay, what else? Any other things that stand out? That Those you... are the big ones. Now you got into blood work. Now I've had over 100 blood tests throughout my career. I uh, started when I was 20 years old. I was hypogonadal as a result of varicocele. I had been training in the gym for two years. I only gained about 14 pounds in two years of hard training. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I finally went to the doctor and found out I had about 120 tests. I had the uh, varicocele, which doesn't cause uh, hypogonadism in everybody who has it, but it is a, is a side effect in a, in, a, in a significant percentage of those people. Um, and so blood testing is important. It can tell you a lot. If you've got a client that's uh, unable to, to lose weight and, they've, uh, and they've, you're pretty sure that they haven't been overeating, you know, sips, snacks, bites, licks, uh, you know, just cheating on their diet in general, uh, there may be at some point a need to get a blood test and see if they're low thyroid, uh, which uh, has some impact on their basal metabolic rate, not as significant as people think, but it has a significant impact on their energy and their non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Got a client that's lifting weights, can't gain muscles, not getting any bigger, uh, not getting any, gaining any strength. Uh, and you've been working hard, you've tried all the lifestyle uh, things that you can do, better sleep and uh, better diet, uh, regular weight training. Go and get a blood test. Maybe they're hypogonadal. Uh, maybe they got low T. That's going to have a significant impact on their ability to, to gain muscle. So I, throughout my career, uh, have utilized blood tests, uh, sometimes on a monthly basis, particularly when I got heavy. Uh, and I do it with all my clients. And I see things like metabolic syndrome, high blood sugars, fatty liver, uh, which would be high triglycerides, hyper, uh, hyperinsulinemia. Uh, might see blood thickness. I might see uh, with performance enhancing drug usage, elevated uh, liver enzymes and kidney enzymes. It'd be AST, ALT, and uh, your kidney markers are creatinine and BUN and EGFR. And so uh, I take a look at all these. I get a really comprehensive test. And I used to do that um, online. Uh, and I'd pay almost $400 for this test. And then Merrick Health comes along and they've got the same test for around 160 bucks. And so cost became uh, a lot 
uh, more affordable. So more of my clients were able to get this test. And I've had parents ask me at what age should kids start getting a test? And, you know, obviously me as early as 20, but I also, I worked with a high school softball team uh, in Arizona, a girls team summer before last. And a couple of parents had told me that their kids were suffering from, they seemed to be a lot really tired lately and their performance had declined. We were measuring their 40 times. And uh, as it turns out, I asked them to get a blood test and both of them had anemia. They were both low iron, very common in high school and collegiate, especially female athletes. I worked with the University of Oregon track runners and football players way back in the early 90s. And the women in particular, uh, and we saw this more recently with the Nike scandal, uh, they would uh, they would suffer from uh, what's called the female triad. It's a chronic calorie restriction, amenorrhea, a cessation of the menstrual period, uh, and uh, uh, low uh, uh, calcium. They would end up having uh, uh, problems with bone mineral density, and they would get shin splints, and they would put casts on and keep running. It was outrageous. They would get low iron, obviously, that would cause a significant amount of fatigue, uh, a lot of them, uh, because of their food choices, they would get hypothyroidism, start seeing some hair loss and a host of other problems associated with uh, the female triad. So these blood tests helped us identify uh, uh, low iron uh, in these uh, anemia in these girls. And so, you know, obviously you'd want to supplement or you'd take a look at their diet. And what you find out is these high school girls, as we discussed earlier in particular, uh, they tend to demonize certain foods, red meat being one of them. Uh, they get rid of the egg yolk. They uh, stop, uh, they get rid of dairy. Uh, they stop eating fruit of all things. People, you know, with the whole carbohydrate. What are they eating? The carbohydrate insulin model. I'll tell you what they're eating. They're eating the guru diet, the, the bikini girl diet that was so popular for, seems like decades now. It's maddening. They'll eat egg whites, tilapia, boneless, skinless chicken breast, um, some broccoli, and uh, maybe a scoop of peanut butter or almond butter, and maybe a scoop of protein powder if, uh, if that fits their diet. And that has very commonly been a pre-contest diet for a lot of these bikini girls. And it was confined to the industry for the longest time. And so I would obviously see all the side effects from that, all of these same health problems, and um, especially uh, when they were competing and post-competition when they would rebound from that. You know, again, the hair loss and all the fatigue and the, the B vitamin deficiencies, and they would end up going to the doctor and getting injections for all of those things. They would get uh, iron, B12, vitamin D, you know, all those, all those things. Uh, and then they would have these massive weight regains and rebounds and edema, I mean, to the point where it's dangerous water retention from avoiding sodium as well. So that's the guru diet, and that's why uh, it's kind of what spawned the vertical diet for me was to that you could get the same results, the same stage presence uh, with the same caloric intake, but uh, suffer a lot less of those problems. When it was confined to the bikini industry, uh, and it was relatively you know small, uh, it was tragic enough. But when that industry became popularized by social media, and now you've got gen pop, you've got soccer moms, copying these same diets, going to these same guru coaches and being prescribed these same diets uh, and suffering all of these same problems. They're not even competing and they're just exhausted, anemia, hypothyroidism. One of the big challenges with that is, is the dirty little secret uh, in the competitive uh, fitness industry, bikini girls, figure, physique, and all of that, um, performance enhancing drugs are utilized to compensate for some of those problems. They'll typically take thyroid. They'll typically take clenbuterol because uh, to, to burn fat, uh, or what they think is going to burn fat because their metabolism is so sluggish. And they'll typically take Anovar uh, to prevent the muscle loss. Well, the soccer mom's not utilizing all of those. So she's, she's getting hit two times over on that deal. Uh, she's losing muscle in a big way. Uh, and suffering from all those other problems, and ending up at the doctor getting prescriptions for medication. So this is what's tragic about that that path that I saw so clearly for decades uh, is that it became mainstream. And so that's why I preach about you know keep a yolk in. It's got the biotin for skin, hair, and nails. You know uh, keep the fruit in. Obviously, we know all the benefits of, of, of fruit. Keep the red meat in, particularly for women. The iron and the B12 and the zinc. 
Um, you know, keep the dairy in. It's huge for calcium. I've got, you know, women suffering from shin splints and bone mineral density loss and uh, keep the calcium in. You need a thousand milligrams a day. And of course, the weight training stimulus is required as well. So these girls, the high school girls, we designed a diet to do just that. If you suffer from anemia and you want to improve your iron intake, uh, red meat is a great foundation, a heme iron source. Add a non-heme iron source like spinach to that. They have a, uh, a complementary benefit and add vitamin C. And that would be uh, peppers is twice the vitamin C as an orange, or you can use orange juice or whatever. And then avoid calcium in that meal as calcium can bind to iron. And so we'll set up a four meal day. One's a high iron meal with high iron absorption with no calcium in it. And the next meal would be your, your dairy, it'd be your yogurts and eggs, whatever. Uh, and we would have two high iron meals and two calcium meals. How concerned are you of, uh, I've seen this a little bit online, people ODing on spinach folates. Is folates a thing? Is that a problem with spinach? Uh, oxalates. Oxalates, that's Some what I mean. people, and in, in this is usually uh, helped by cooking it or getting sufficient calcium in the diet. Some people who uh, uh, are predisposed to suffering from uh, kidney stones, the oxalates may increase their, their likelihood of getting kidney stones. Uh, but if you cook the spinach and you eat sufficient calcium, it's very, uh, very low likelihood of that. Mm. Uh, but that is... Uh, something that some people need to pay attention to. Uh, and I'm not talking about overdosing on, on spinach either. You know, again, <laughs> Dude, I, I, if there's one, one food that I could overdose on, I think it might be spinach. Yeah. That goes with, that's, there's very few meals that it doesn't go with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, uh, to finish off on, on the, on the men's side of iron, men tend to be high iron. Uh, uh, because they don't have the menstrual period. Women do, and that's where they lose a lot of their iron. And so uh, you can do a couple of things. You can reduce your red meat intake. Uh, you can donate blood. You can increase calcium consumption during your red meat meals. I keep a normal iron, even though I eat a significant amount of red meat by eating a, a, a lot of yogurt throughout the day. Uh, and then a lot of fruit as well, which decreases any inflammation. Um, also uh, avoid, um, um, what are those, uh, those cast iron pans. Uh, I've had some episodes over the years where I've eaten a lot. Of, I, I would get onto a cast iron pan steak kick for a while. And I would, because of my getting blood tests on a regular basis, I would start to see my iron levels. It's uh, literally rest. bleeding from the pan yes. into the food. Yes. So what, what are your cooking utensils of choice? Are you an air fryer guy? Are you a slow I'm cooker guy? I'm addicted to the, to the Ninja air fryer. I mentioned them by name because that thing's magical. There's like little chefs in there cooking your food for you. I don't know how they do it. Advice for people, the specific one that Michaela Peterson got me to get is the XL Max. Yeah. So the XL too- is the size and then it goes 450. Yeah. And from frozen, yeah. a steak 11 minutes on one side, yeah. 11 minutes on the other if you've salted the living shit out of it. Yeah. You, you, your food never spoils. You're, right. You never spoil food because it goes from being yeah. preserved for the rest of time to being edible in 25 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Game changer. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to stay on that because, um, and I'm going to come back. Uh, let me just say it real quick. High iron for men, donating blood, not a good idea to overdonate. Be very careful about trying to keep, especially men on performance enhancing drugs or testosterone uh, replacement therapy, they'll notice their hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red blood cells will start to elevate. It's a condition called erythrocytosis, not to be confused with polycythemia. Polycythemia is a condition where you will need to donate because you get thick blood. Erythrocytosis can happen in elevation uh, uh, and with testosterone use, and it doesn't necessarily indicate uh, a thick blood or a dangerous situation that needs donating. Dr. Neil Rousier has uh, some great information on this. Uh, the problem is, is when people start chasing, normalizing those numbers, the hemoglobin hematocrit red blood cells into the normal range, and they start donating on a monthly basis, they drive their iron down. Next thing you know, their ferritin tanks, and they start giving right. themselves anemia. So what's a, if somebody does have high ferritin, high iron, once every, once every two months, once every six months. Donate. Yeah, you want to keep iron down. Donate, uh, you know, reduce red meat, increase calcium intake. Uh, some people uh, are uh, high iron genetically. Dr. Chris Masterjohn, PhD nutrition. Uh, but he still eats red meat and just donates periodically because he likes all of the benefits of the red meat. He would hate to, uh, you know, forego all of those things that he, he, he could just donate periodically. 
Uh, so, you know, these are decisions that individuals can make based on their blood work, which is why I like having access to it. Uh, just a quick trip back to the the air fryer. <laughs> and this is, a lot of times, you know, diet success is, is you know, we've said, like in sports, it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. When I'm talking diet, sometimes I, f- I feel it's unfortunate that I spend so much time on the information because you know this can be boiled down to, to a three by five card in about less than a minute. You could give somebody a diet plan that that you know, would, uh, and it's really ninety nine percent execution. And so, a lot of what I focus on when I say compliance is the science is these little things that make um, that make it easier to uh, administer the diet. And something like uh, that grill, it, you know, your hands off. It, it's just so convenient. The food tastes good. That's really important. If you get on one of these diets where you don't enjoy the food, then it's a temporary thing. Uh, so it's important I do that. Other things that I call life-changing, and I don't say this about a lot of things because I've been in the business for 30 years. And I just got done shitting all over everybody's everything because it wasn't meaningful, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but there's things that make a big difference. I talked about toting Tupperwares around in your six-pack bag. Some years ago, for some reason, I don't know why, I came across the thermos, a little 24-ounce double insulated thermos that I would put hot food in and it would stay hot for 10, 12 plus hours, depending on how hot it was. Hang on. So you've got a cylinder of food. I ate one when I landed at the airport. I've got one in my bag. A cylinder of food. A cylinder of food <laughs> that stays vertical. hot. So I make my monster mash, right? <laughs> and I put it in there. Okay. And you need a $1 can jarring funnel. These are the things that I do for my clients that they really appreciate. It's not the diet and the macros and all that other stuff. When I tell them to get the $1 jarring funnel so they can easily f- you know, spoon their food into a thermos that keeps it hot for 10 hours. Is there a specific brand of thermos? Thermos. That's d- straight up thermos? Yeah. And what uh, size? Any double insulated steel wall Liter, container. liter and a half, uh, two liters? 24 liter. ounce for me gives me a good meal. I got one for my kids that's a little smaller. It's about a, around about a liter, I think that? Uh, uh, half a liter, I half think, liter. 24 okay. ounces. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, little things like that. I mean, I took five thermos to Moscow with me. That's a 22-hour day, as you know. By the time you you stop over and land and go through security and then uh, you know customs and end up at your hotel. I had five of these thermos when I left my house uh, in my carry bag that I rolled in here today that slides under the seat. So every three or four hours as needed, as I desire, I'm eating a nice hot full meal. I'll have a couple of oranges in my bag, maybe a little baggie of carrots. The only thing I can't take on the plane with me that I wish I could to finish this off would be some yogurt. Have you ever been pulled to one side with all the time? Five Every time. thermos Every flasks time. They make filled you open them up. with they make you open them up and mash. Them. Yeah. Right. That's part of you gotta get there 10 minutes early, but it's well worth it. Right. Okay. So you now, you account for additional TSA checking time. Absolutely. Because yep. of this and that way, I don't have to forage for food at uh, at the airports wow. or at room service. Or How do you get you. to the bottom? Can a fork get to the bottom of a you thermos flask? It, it does pretty well. Do you end up? Yeah. I, you can reach if you extend the fingers. You can get to the bottom. <laughs> right. Okay. There. Okay. So, uh, Ninja Air Fryer. Ninja Air Fryer is pretty important. The thermos and the the jarring funnel is yes. pretty good. The Monster Mash tool. This is something that's. Uh, I get these tips from my from my uh, fans and followers and and friends. Uh, somebody sent me the, a picture of this Monster Mash tool. It's a uh, it, like on the bottom. It's like X shaped, uh, and so you can mash your food all together. I was using a fork you know, for the longest time. Oh right, okay, yeah, that's yeah. primitive. Come on, it's primitive. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, little things like that. Um, the CPAP, of course, is one that's life changing yep. for me and for my clients. These are the kinds of things that when somebody gets done uh, getting a diet from me, they're like, oh my God, this tastes so good. And now my wife's eating it. Macros were fantastic, but that thermos thing. It's its amazing. Yep. So now oh, your compliance is improved because you don't, you know, and that's, if you're a real estate agent, you know, working out of the trunk of your car during the day, you know, what are your options? You know, fast food, or do you have all your meals ready for you? And in the absence of a microwave, you know, you can just, and you got a nice hot meal with an orange someone, and some carrots. Someone is listening to this right now that should make a clippable, stackable, thermos equivalent hold heat in for a food prep. Yeah. Like an upgraded six pack bag type thing. It'll probably happen. There's a business, there's a million dollar business idea just for free. You know what I mean? Those are the things that excite me. 
Hell yeah. You can see how animated I get when I talk about it. I love it. I love it. We did an entire series on this podcast, 20 20 plus episodes called Life Hacks, how to make the perfect toasted sandwich off the best uh, carry-on luggage that we'd found, yeah. uh, the place that you can lie down in Amsterdam airport and sleep because it's the one set of settees that doesn't have arm bars between them to stop right. you from, like, just <laughs> we'd accumulated this stuff over, over years and years. And you're right, the, you know, the, ultimately, if compliance is the science and one of the biggest impediments to complying is the friction around doing the thing and the yeah. enjoyment of doing the yeah. thing, you're right. It, a slow cooker and an air fryer is a chef inside of a box. Yes. One of them works very quickly. One of them works unbelievably slowly. Put it in, you and your kids, and you walk and you go about your morning. And, and then food appears. done in that 10, 15 minutes. And then food appears. It just comes out. Yeah, like it was cooked for you. Stan Efferding, ladies and gentlemen. Stan, I love you. I, I, you I think that your work is fantastic. It's a brilliant redress, very balanced. Where should people go? They want to check out the book. They want to check out your, yeah, your courses. Stan everything. Efforting. StanEfforting.com will get you access to the meal prep company and access to my Vertical Diet 3.0 ebook, soon to be 4.0. I update it and I give uh, future copies for free to anybody who bought a previous Oh, wow. Copy. So yeah. you get it and it's always updated. It's a living document. I keep updating it Hell over yeah. time. So uh, at Stan Efforting is my Instagram. Uh, and then the Rhino's Rants are on YouTube at Stan Efforting. And, and they're, some of them are old, but they're fun. They're, uh, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of good stuff. People really enjoy those. Stan, I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode with Stan, then press here for the full length two hour podcast with Dr. Peter Atia, where we go through diet, training, all of that VO2 max stuff that we spoke about today. Go on. Press it. <laughs>